Good morning and welcome to the Ground Ambulance and Patient Billing Advisory Committee meeting. My name is Tara Sanderson and I will be serving as the facilitator for today's meeting. We have a number of subject matter experts with us today who will provide information on various ground ambulance and patient billing topics. Today's session is being recorded by your attendance today. You are giving consent to the use and distribution of your name, likeliness, and voice during this webinar. Before we dive into the discussion, there are a few logistics that may be helpful for participation in today's session. If you need to connect your audio, follow the audio prompts that appear when you join Zoom. We recommend using the call me or connect via computer audio options to ensure your name is synced with your audio. If you select call me, enter your phone number, including the area code. If you have an extension, you can enter your phone number followed by a hyphen and then your extension. Your meeting controls are located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. To view the chat box, you will select the chat icon in the toolbar. We will be taking public comment. To participate when the chat is open, type your question into the chat box and hit enter. Please include your name and organizational affiliation when using the chat feature. Public comments, more than three sentences, should be submitted via email to GAPB Advisory Committee at cms.hhs.gov. We hope everyone has a great experience today. At this time, I will turn it over to Shaheen Halim. Thank you, Tara, and good morning, everyone. Next slide, please. I'll start by just uh, providing a brief background of uh, the purpose of this committee and the authorizing legislation for those who are joining um, our committee meetings for the first time. So this advisory committee, the Ground Ambulance and Patient Billing Advisory Committee, is authorized by the No Surprises Act of 2021. Um, the uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, governs the formation and operation of this committee. Uh, we officially um, announced the uh, committee membership in December of 2022, and we held our first public meeting in uh, May of this year, May 2nd and 3rd, um, and for those of you who are joining for the first time, if you wish to access those materials, they are available on the Ground Ambulance and Patient Billing Committee website that is hosted on cms.gov. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned the authorizing legislation. Um, the uh, scope of this committee is also statutorily mandated, set in statute. The um, Scope of this committee are to review options for disclosing for uh, disclosure of charges and fees for ground ambulance services to consumers. Um, ways to better inform consumers of insurance options for ground ambulance services and ways to protect consumers from balance billing. Next slide please. This committee um, must submit a report with their recommendations on those topics to the Departments of Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, and Department of Treasury. And uh, the report must include uh, recommendations on uh, disclosure of charges and fees for ground ambulance services um, and insurance coverage, consumer protections and enforcement authorities, preventing balance billing, and um, also potential regulatory and um, legislative updates uh, that would allow for enhanced um, enforcement. This report is due approximately 180 days after the committee first convenes. So um, we will uh, be expecting a report uh, later this fall from the committee. Uh, the GAPB advisory committee will not be deviating from the statutorily required um, topics and um, uh, due to the short nature of their tenure and um, the quick turnaround for the report. Next slide, please. So back in May, when we uh, had our first meeting, uh, two subcommittees were formed uh, under the larger committee in order to pursue uh, specific topics that were um, uh, arising, particularly in, in the first meeting. And these subcommittees are um, 
network adequacy and cost payment structures, and um, public consumer disclosure and coverages. Today's meeting will focus on the preliminary findings of these two subcommittees um, and uh, uh, preliminary recommendations of these two subcommittees. We have posted a detailed agenda uh, for today with the topics at uh, the GAPB website, which uh, you see on your screen here. Next slide, please. So uh, public comment. At this meeting, we do seek uh, substantial public input on the following issues that have um, come under consideration. Um, and there are 14 topics total. Um, I will, I can briefly read through them. Um, we will also be putting um, a link to, or a uh, Word document to download. These 14 topics are located in the agenda that is publicly posted on our website. So first topic, should balance bills for ground ambulance services be prohibited as with other services currently under the purview of the No Surprises Act? Would it be appropriate to incorporate ground ambulance services into existing NSA protections? Should any protections apply to non-emergency transports? If so, should those protections differ for, from emergency transports? Should any protections apply to assessment, first responder, or other non-covered fees? How can meaningful public and or consumer disclosures be crafted? Should there be cost-sharing limitations for EMS in Medicare Advantage? Should there be a federal universal EMS benefit? Next slide, please. Should EMTs and paramedics be classified as providers? Should state and local governments specify the out-of-network reimbursements? Should a public utility model be deployed? Should emergency ambulance services be considered in network since the consumer has no choice when they call 911? We are also seeking information related to um, examples where consumers have received balance bills from ambulance uh, providers for services not covered by an insurance carrier. Um, we seek information about what communities or areas in the United States are without adequate emergency ambulance service coverage. Additional topics are, should NSA protections apply to volunteer ambulance services, service agencies? Next slide, please. So uh, the 14 uh, topics that I uh, read earlier are available in the agenda that is posted on the GAPB website. We will be, um, you, you will be able to submit public comment during this meeting um, using the chat function at um, specified points during this meeting. Um, the comments that you put in the chat uh, feature should be limited to about three sentences. Um, and again, as Tara said earlier, please include your name and organizational affiliation when you use this mechanism. We highly recommend that lengthy comments of more than three sentences should be submitted via email to GAPB advisory committee at cms.hhs.gov. Public comment can be submitted at any time to this email address. However, we highly recommend that you submit comments on the 14 topics that were listed previously uh, and, and are listed in the detail agenda by September 5th of this, uh, 2023 in order to ensure timely consideration by the committee. Next slide. I will now turn it over to Asbel Montes, our chairperson. Hi, so good morning, everyone, and thank you, Shaheen. Um, but we are excited that you are here. We're excited for the committee to be here. Um, and I know the many hours of work that the committee um, has undergone over the last several months um, in their public service duty, because this is all volunteer. Um, and this committee has um, taken it upon themselves to really um, dissect through the issues, hence some of the public comment and input that we are continuing to seek. 
Um, so thank you for um, that introduction, um, Shaheen, in here. We also want to thank our special guest today, um, and I'll kind of do a review on the next slide over, but we are happy that NHTSA and NIMSIS are here providing us with some much needed data. Um, and then we'll talk through how that public comment and questions that the public, and maybe you're not on the committee, and how maybe you can get your questions through that process as well. And then we will have this afternoon um, the Office for Civil Rights kind of give us a overview of how HIPAA um, works and, inter and interacts with the um, EMS industry um, as that has come up in some topic of conversations and some of our subcommittees on sometimes patients and consumers maybe receiving a balanced bill um, due to the interpretation of HIPAA. And so we're thankful that they're here as well. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is just kind of refresh where we've been. Uh, Shaheen alluded to a little bit about this in um, her opening remarks as well, but the committee has been meeting every Wednesday since the May 2nd, 3rd meetings. And we have put this into two different subcommittees, co-led by Rogelyn McLean and Lee Resnick. Um, Rogelyn, who is a committee member and representing uh, C uh, HHS on this call, CMS, as well as Lee Resnick, who is um, also uh, works with CMS, while not on this committee, has been a subject matter expert that has really provided some much needed support. Um, and then we've had another subcommittee member, um, meet, uh, subcommittee also led by Lauren Adler um, and Patricia Kilmer, who have done yeoman's work uh, putting together and kind of helping to um, continue to steer conversation. And they will provide um, information. Um, while we may not have um, recommendations for the committee to deliberate on today. They do have a lot of um, information, preliminary findings that um, we have been discussing and some of the involvement that will happen um, towards the end of the conversation. So we've actually explored four main areas in, this, in these subcommittees, and those four main areas um, really center around consumer and provider disclosures, coverages, the cost of ambulance care, and then how local and state regulations impact how the consumer is billed for these charges or these services. And so that is something that has been explored at length. It has opened up a window into needing additional input from the public and hence the reason why you saw those 14 questions. And we are really asking that when we open up the public comment today, if you've got some public comment, we, we would love to see that as well as your written comments by September the 5th as well. In addition to that, there has been a lot of work and a lot of subject matter experts that have presented from our state regulators, um, from the Insurance Commission to other state regulators, some industry experts from billing agencies that have provided much needed data to us, federal agencies. You'll hear some of that today um, from NHTSA and, some, and NIMSIS and some of the public data that is available out there that has actually um, kind of open the eyes of the committee on certain things that we might need to address in our recommendations. Next slide. So here's what to expect today. Um, we, uh, right after this, uh, Raj McLean and Lee will kind of start walking through some things as the agenda happens. We're going to do some new things, and Raj will kind of talk about that as we do some committee deliberation on definitions as well. But they'll, uh, they'll update us on some preliminary findings. And we will open it up for Q&A for the committee at first. Um, you will see in the chat dialogue some committee questions if committee members have questions. And then when the time comes for public input, um, our contractor PRI will open up the chat and then we will moderate the chat. And I will be your moderator today to ensure that we have transparency and inclusion throughout the process as well. And so again, we wanna thank you for attending today. And then we will stay pretty much as tight to the timeline as possible. So we have allowed some time at the very end of today. If we run out of time for public comment to allow for more public comment um, via the chat as well. So this time I'm gonna turn it over to Tara since we're right on time with this and we will turn it over to our first presenters. So Tara. Thank you. For our first session of the day, we have Rogela McLean and Lee Resnick who are our co-leads for the subcommittee on network adequacy and cost and payment structures and they will be reviewing with us terms and definitions. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, again, this is going to be um, a very active work session where we are 
looking at terms and definitions um, that are going to be relevant both to our recommendations and our work. Next slide. So the first thing that we like to do on every um, activity we embark on is to make sure that we have clarity in our mind on what our statutory mandate is and what that activity, how that activity relates to our statutory mandate. So these terms and conditions are going to be important to our role in addressing the statutory mandate of providing recommendations on potential federal, state, and local regulatory and enforcement options um, for preventing ground ambulance billing and protecting consumers. Um, and so this is our relevant statutory mandate, and you'll see how this work will um, feed into that. Next slide. So the goal of this activity um, was to arrive at or recommend, recommend definitions of terms, first for which we should all have a common understanding so that we ensure um, productive deliberations and recommendations that are clear on their face. So many of these definitions we're going to talk about um, may not turn into definitions that we involve in a formal recommendation. Um, to the folks that we're reporting to, members of Congress and the secretaries of the Departments of a, um, Health and Human Services, Labor and Treasury. Um, others of these definitions will be um, potentially parts of recommendations, and we will discuss um, why we think as a subcommittee, it's important that not only that we have a common understanding of some terms, but that possibly some terms um, be codified in order to um, come up with a, an effective scheme to address um, balance billing in ground ambulance. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. So here are the basic terms that we're going to be discussing today. Um, as we go through them, we will um, try to explain whether we're discussing this in terms of formal recommendation or whether again we're just all you know need to get on the same page with regard to the meanings of these terms and we will try to um, make sure that we distinguish between the two purposes as we discuss them um, but I do want to call out that as we continue our work what we intend today may not what we intend a, a week from now. So definitions that we are discussing today and don't necessarily plan to make a part of a recommendation um, as we deliberate and as we go through our work, um, that too should change, could change. So just keep that in mind. Um, a general note for your listening as we're going through these terms um, is like as Bill said, at a certain point, we're going to stop for public comment. So um, please do us all a favor. And as you're listening, please note what questions and suggestions you have so that by the time we get to that public comment, you'll remember them and can share them. We're going to go through a certain run of show. This is going to be a bit of a um, experiment for us in, in live work sessions and deliberations um, in a public forum. So please have patience with us. I just want to describe a little run of show on, um, for our committee members and for the public as we go through this. Um, as step one, again, we're going to identify why we're talking about this term and definition. Um, as step two, we're going to try to identify the general issues we're addressing um, by discussing these terms and definitions. Step three, we're going to, um, I want to make sure that all of our committee members have a, ch have a chance to weigh in on what they see as the problem or the issue or the topic as it relates to these terms. And the last step is that we're going to go through and invite discussion on these definitions and actually go through and um, play with the terms and get input from both our committee members and the public. So please, um, when we get started, please make use of your electronic hand. Um, I've got about three screens going right now, so I'm going to ask my team to help me when folks are raising their hands so I don't miss anybody. But um, let's jump in and see how it goes. Next slide. So one of the things that when we get to the feedback part um, that we are looking for input on um, we want to hear your questions, your comments, or your concerns about these terms and definitions. 
And we'd also like to hear if there are other terms that we haven't discussed um, that we do need to discuss, um, including where there are currently codified definitions that for one reason or the other, we feel um, may need to be honed or slightly revised for the context of ground ambulance services. So keep that in mind as we're discussing. Next slide. So here's our work session. So PRI, here's the chance that I need to share my screen and we will see how this little experiment goes. Okay. So the first term that we're gonna discuss this morning, um, and let me ask, can everybody see that Word document up on the screen? Great. The first term we wanna discuss today is build charge. For build charge, um, at this point, the purpose of us discussing this is for clarity, but of course, this is one of those that as we go through this work, it could change and become a part of a finding or a recommendation. So one of the reasons that we're talking about bill charges is that many times these terms are used um, interchangeably and indiscriminately. You might hear about the price for a service. You might hear about just a charge. You might hear about the build amount. So what we want to do is set a definition for bill charge so that we all know that when we talk about that term, we all know exactly what we're talking about. Um, at, at this point, I'd like to invite other members of the committee to weigh in on the definite on the term bill charge and why they think it's important that we have a common understanding um, of that term. Would anybody on the committee like to speak on that? Pete? Roger, I see Pete, yeah. Yep. We can't hear you, Pete. You may be double muted. Asbel, while Pete is working that out, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I'm thinking, um, I know bill charge from my um, point of view, I think this definition is pretty clear. Um, if we're looking at it from a bill charge, not just from our viewpoint, but from a healthcare provider viewpoint, but it really is the charge that the consumer receives before insurance may be billed, if they're a self-pay or they don't have insurance um, or what have you. Um, I think this would cover it um, at this point in time, but I think it is important because some people consider bill charge to be usual and customary could be what the charge master from the provider perspective is. And so I think it's important that we define or make sure that we're all saying the same language when we're talking about the actual um, charge for the service before insurance is applied or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I see Rhonda has her hand Rhonda, up. Yes. Hi, Raj, thank you. Um, I was just thinking, um, as Asbel said, we may have some self-insured consumers out there or people who don't have health insurance. Um, so we might need to add a statement about that as well because this looks like it's just to um, a health plan. Okay, so Rhonda, let's look at that. So we want to say the total charges for a healthcare service so is your suggestion that we also bring in um, the self-insured plans? Yes. Okay. But I, I don't think she was meaning the plans, the actual self-insured patients. Right. The patients. An insured consumer. Yeah. Okay. To a, do we, to an uninsured consumer? An insured consumer or a health benefit plan. Okay. Thank you. All right, great. 
And I wanted to mention while we're discussing, you'll see in these um, work papers that we have listed references. And um, we had our subcommittee members who did yeoman's work in looking for existing definitions for this. And so when you see those references, um, those are either definitions that are codified or that we use to kind of adapt that definition to come up with our working definition. All right, did we get Pete back? You able to hear me? Perfect, I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Well, first off, you thanks Raj for putting this together. I mean, you, you enlarged it, which made it so much easier to, to <laughs> see. Uh, yes. Um, on this, um, and I agree with with adding in, you know, to deal with the consumer. But should we be worried about whether it's uninsured or anything? Should it just be total charges for a healthcare service or supply billed to a consumer or health benefit plan? Does it matter whether it's uninsured? Because some places, uh, I mean, they may be insured, but we're not able to bill it because it could be that it's out of, uh, you know, out of country. For example, everything's mm -hmm. billed to the consumer. So is the word is the word uninsured critical or should we just be identifying consumer? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think I think the emphasis is really on the total charge from the provider. I mean, they, they could okay. be sent. I mean, where who, to whom they're sending it is kind of immaterial. So much as this is the focus on will, where the bill is originating. Okay, that sounds right to me. Rhonda, how does that sound to you? I think that sounds it. great, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Any other comments? Because we're, we're going, you'll see that we're not following um, alphabetical order and I've kind of grouped them together. Um, Raj, in I think, that we can I think Lauren has a comment as well, Raj. Okay, Lauren. Thanks. Um, I was just, this is sort of a question for this and sort of the following definitions on things that are, you know, defined a bunch of places in federal code already. Are we like planning to use this sort of forward looking, writing down anywhere? Because right for just like, if we were writing this in a definition in a new law, there's technical wording on like the health insurance issue or group health plan or individual, like sure. a specific wording that would just sort of be used. But I, for, if it's just for our internal purposes of understanding, I don't think that's terribly important. Right. And when we get to um, all of, you know, this is going to be preliminary work. So after we finish our work today, we're going to um, basically get these working definitions out to the group. Um, so that folks can look at them again and we can talk about um, things like that um, as far as where we need to be more precise, especially on those terms that we may be recommending be codified. And just, just building on, on Lauren's point, I, that is something, I'm, some of these um, do have existing definitions within the CFR. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if we want to, I, I don't know if we're obligated to note that that distinction or if we, if we want to note that we're, Kind of for discussion purposes, adopting something that is different than what's already in um, federal regulation. Right. And, and again, I don't anticipate that we will actually vote on these definitions today, but those particular conversations are those that we can have once we have all the input on what the definitions should look like and what, um, what we're trying to solve for with the definitions, because I think that's going to take you know, a lot of deep work when we start talking about recommendations for codification. And so you'll see as we go through this, we are pointing out where there are, um, especially where we've used NSA definitions. Um, so that is something that I think we're going to have to continue to talk about as we work on these definitions, because of course, if any one of them turns into a recommendation, we're going to have to explain why we think for ground ambulance, that definition should be different from the definition that's codified. And then we will have to be very careful about honing and, and making sure that the language is specific and uses the right terms. Does that work? Okay. All right. So from here, let's go on to the next term, which is allowed amount. Um, here we are referencing, um, again, to make this, this discussion for allowed amount. Um, we do feel like this term is pretty well accepted in the industry. Um, and that that term 
it is codified. And so what we are, it's not codified in this form, but a loud amount is worked into the current NSA scheme for medical services, but where this definition comes from, and again here, making sure we're all on the same page, is the healthcare.gov uniform glossary. And so that working definition would be the maximum amount a plan will pay for covered healthcare service, may also be eligible expense, payment allowment, or negotiated rate. Now, the reason that we're talking about allowed amount is again, because as you're using that term, you may see it used differently. Um, does anybody want to weigh in, committee members, on um, kind of the issues we see with the term allowed amount and what we're trying to solve for? All right, so this one looks pretty straightforward. Does anybody have any recommendations um, for revisions, additions? All right, move on to the next. So the next one we had discussed was patient responsibility. Again, this is um, a term that we are addressing to make sure that we are all on the same page and using the same vocabulary. Um, patient responsibility can often be confused with balance bills, surprise bills, um, but we want to make sure that we're discussing this in the context that it is um, often used in the terms of health insurance. Does anyone want to weigh in the problems that we're trying to solve with adopting a definition for patient responsibility? Raj, I'm just going to make a comment here. Okay. I think it's really important um, as, and, and why this exercise has been really important in our subcommittees is this right here, I think is where it gets confusing for consumers, for providers and carriers that might be using patient responsibility synonymously with balance billing. Yes. Um, and so I think this is a really, really important reference point that's already been um, codified in healthcare.gov that I think will guide the continued work of our committee, especially as we move into the second half of our deliberative work. Um, right. So I want our, the committee to, to look at this from that perspective and to understand, is there anything that they want to add or amend into it? So when we talk about balance billing, it's different than patient responsibility. Right. Tricia. Thanks. So this is maybe not particular to this particular definition, but I would say that there's general confusion with a lot of these terms amongst the build patient population. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could do a really great service in trying to move our ambulance bills and medical bills in general to a more consumer friendly language. So, you know, sometimes patient responsibility, it's it's not clear that it's already been submitted to insurance if you are insured it's not clear whether this is the final bill and all of the different charges have come on this final bill so i think you know as we're moving through these we might want to then step back and think about these might be what the law or the recommendations for what the law would say uh, are, but then I think it would behoove us to come up with a friendly bill that helps people understand whether or not the amount that they're owing is the what they have to pay, uh, whether it's already been run through insurance, whether it counts for their deductible, all of those kinds of things that can cause people to get really confused. Right. And so, Patricia, that would kind of work into our disclosure work? Yeah, um, but yeah. also, I mean, if we are going to codify some of these definitions or borrow, um, we might want to think about clarifying some of them. And if there's like five or six different like versions of it, I noticed one of the definitions said it's also known as this. It's also known as that, that we kind mm -hmm. of limit, limit that so we can right. try to get people to talk one language on a bill. Right. Okay. Well, does anyone have recommendations for um, our working definition here? I see Ritu has his hand raised, um, okay. Raj. Ritu. 
Hi there. Yeah. So, um, just to support Patty's concern, um, this is not a very patient centric definition. And, uh, um, so I think we should acknowledge that. I think we, I think that it makes sense that we use this definition because that's sort of what the industry uses, but, um, our, our, um, constituency, if you will, is not just, um, the industry, but it's our patients. And, and this is going to be a source of confusion, I think, uh, for the, for the patient population as they look at our recommendations. Okay. So Richie, what I hear you saying is that we may need to either look at coming up with a more understandable plain language definition. Yeah, or I think that would be great. Um, I just think also that this is the type of this is the type of definition that is just confusing enough that as we move forward, and especially when we put recommendations out, that um we just have to be really clear. I mean, we're this, and that's completely the 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 exercise we're going through now is to ensure that we're clear about what we say. And and mm -hmm. um, but even I think kind of anything that we put out there, I would almost want to be even more clear that it's this specific definition of patient responsibility. Because I agree, if I'm a patient, I'm gonna and I get a balanced bill. Well, that's my responsibility too, right? So. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay. I always just want to be patient centric in general, too. Huh? No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Raj, I think this is probably a good time to get some more public input because I know the lawyers on the phone um, are in our committee and others. And I'd be interested to hear from Adam as well from the insurance side of it that I know once you start messing with a definition that is very interrelated with a lot of statutes mm -hmm. uh, it gets it gets problematic pretty quickly and so I'm almost wondering if this should uh -huh. go into a more patient-centric in disclosures mm -hmm. um, and how we disclose to the patient so it makes it very simple and I think maybe that's what Patricia was possibly getting at with a consumer-friendly bill that they might receive and that might be the discussion that we have there as well. And, and then invite some more public comment on that. Okay. Yeah. And I, and as Bill, to your point, I think that's why you need to use this definition is because it's so interrelated to other places and it's sort of an accepted definition. So I think we have to use it. I think we just have to acknowledge that it's not necessarily what a patient would call their responsibility. I think, as well, to your point, when in, in talking about, um, you know, as a public disclosure, I think anywhere we're introducing something new into the conversation or proposing uh, or as part of our recommendations, um, you know, offering up ideas for something that doesn't really currently exist in regulation or in the No Surprises Act structure, I think we have a lot more ability there to then kind of start from a patient and consumer centric approach to make sure that we're using language in, in our recommendation that isn't as legalese and isn't as kind of um, intertwined with all of these, these other intersecting um, regulatory definitions. So I think there, when we're, when we're talking about something new, we can make sure that we're keeping that patient centric. Um, and I think that might help the recommendation then ultimately be clear to those that, that we're recommending it to. They can, they can worry about the, the legalese and the regulatory language when, you know, if and when it actually turns into um, to a to a regulatory proposal, but for our purposes, I think we want to convey what we're trying to do for consumers and for patients when possible. Okay. Those sound like great ideas. And I think what I'm hearing now is that um, we're okay with this definition and moving forward, we are going to work on, you know, a plan for making sure that patients and other laymen that read our report and read our recommendations um, can clearly understand what, what we're referring to. Did that, did that capture it to make sure we kind of capture that um, future work we want to do? I think so. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All Sorry, right. I'm not sure about that. Sorry, Alexis Bean. 
interrupting today. So the next one we have is balance bill. Um, I think um, like Asbel had explained before, the issue with this term is that many times the term is confused with a surprise bill. Not all balance bills are surprise bills. Um, so what we are working with this working definition here came from the healthcare.gov uni uniform glossary. You can see this particular definition is I believe more um, consumer friendly. Um, so what do we think about this definition when a provider bills you for the difference between the provider's charge and the allowed amount? Um, the first thing I was thinking about is, does it need additional detail to distinguish it from a surprise bill? What do folks think? Sean? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I think the one thing we might want to consider is that this does not uh, clearly differentiate from um, cost sharing as we defined previously. And uh, I know there's one, um, there's a CFR reference to a definition that does include, we can, I can find it and send it uh, for consideration, but we might just make a note to make sure that we find a definition without recreating the wheel, um, if there's another one in statute or, or somewhere that um, makes sure that cost sharing isn't included in balance bill so that the two line up together, the one that we okay. did previously in this. Okay. Okay, so we will do something that includes cost sharing and my recollection when I've seen others. So Sean, that would be maybe when a provider bills you for the difference between the provider's charge and the allowed amount. Um, I think I've seen something right around here. It would say something like, and does not include cost sharing. Yeah, Okay. exactly. And, and you I might want to add- things when I, I, you know, when it may need more work, so just ignore that. You might want to add build charge since you've defined that earlier. Okay. If, if that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Providers build charge here. Does that work, Patricia? Yeah, I mean, if that's what you're talking about, because we defined what a build charge is. I don't know what a provider's charge is if it's not a build charge, but there might be a difference, so. Okay, I'll just bracket that so we can check that. Lauren. Um, yeah, I was just going to add in, it's probably useful to clarify that it is when a provider not in your health plans network bills you for the difference so that it's not to clarify that it's not an in-network provider can't balance bill you. Um, this is only an out-of-network provider thing. Okay. Yeah, and I would, I, I, and I think that gets at the, the, the preferred provider language, I would just modify to generally refer to a provider that's in a health plans network since preferred provider can be specific to a particular plan type. So I wouldn't want folks to kind of look at that and wonder what that, what that means. So a network hey, provider? Roger. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just going to say your, your screen got really big. <laughs> oh, did it? I'm not sure why. Unless I did something on my end. It Is might be better? on your end, Pete. I think it's fine on our end. Yeah, it looks fine here. Okay. Now it's getting it might be just me. Oh, okay. Okay, I fixed it. All right. And the only thing I would add um, to your point that you made earlier, um, Raj, was mm -hmm. distinguishing also, I don't know if we have surprise bill in our definition list. I can't remember looking we at We do. That. It's actually coming up next. Perfect. Yep. Excellent. So you might want to just, we might just want to maybe make a reference um, balance bill. 
make a reference somehow in there since this is kind of for a consumer friendly side of it that we're looking at right now. Okay, so we want to make a reference to surprise bill that distinguishes. Right, like you would want to know provider not to be confused with surprise bill. Okay. Because they're used interchangeably. Right. Okay. Rhonda? I've seen some states that are actually putting a statement in there that a balance bill may be a surprise bill because the consumer wasn't expecting it. I don't know if that's something we want to do, but maybe just uh, look at some other language from various states. Okay. Okay, Pete? Okay. Hey, Rod. Hey. Oh, sorry, I was having an issue there. Um, there is a uh, language in, I think it's federal regulation, that the definition of a balanced bill is the practice of outer network providers billing patients for the difference between one, the provider's bill charges, and two, the amount collected from the planner issuer plus the amount collected from the patient in the form of cost sharing, such as a co payment, co insurance, or amounts paid towards a deductible. And I can get you that uh, that language and that citation if uh, uh, after the meeting. Perfect. Okay. That's eighty six uh, CFR thirty six eight seventy two. I think is what it says. Thirty six. Three six eight seventy two. All right. I believe that's the citation, but I'll get it to you. Okay. Perfect. Anybody else, Sean? Um, this just goes back to a comment, I think, from Rhonda on the statement that a balance bill may be a surprise bill. And I, I guess I just want to kind of get a little bit clarified that um, what we're really talking about is something that, again, sort of distinguishes between cost sharing that would be expected even and, and balance billing that would be unexpected, but that from a consumer point of view, I think they may not even realize they have a cost sharing amount, like a high deductible or uh, a significant copay or co-insurance or something. Is that kind of what you were thinking, Rhonda? Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. Okay. Okay. And, and I think, and I think, um, Raj, this goes to the point again when we had when we were at that one definition that's legalese. And mm-hmm. it's not necessarily consumer friendly at this point in time. This dialogue we're having right now is reiterating because technically the balance bill is really only the amount that does nothing to do with cost sharing or deductible or copay. And so I think that's really important what's the dialogue that's happening here um, that we make sure because you really are distinguishing between balance bill, surprise bill, which those could be one or the other, as Rhonda indicated. But then the definition of the um, participant's responsibility or the patient responsibility, Mm -hmm. um, that is three different things from the from statutory that's codified into a lot of statute. Now, we need to make this to Patricia's point very consumer because the consumer doesn't understand that. Um, individuals that are involved in all of this understand some of the difference. And even sometimes we don't understand that we're confused ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is a really good point to make as we start walking through disclosures and then how that interrelates to statute. I agree. I agree. All right. I think we got um, enough to be getting along with, with working on this definition. Anything else before we move on? Okay. So going to next would be our definition of surprise bill. Um, You'll see that I have a couple of reference definitions um, as well as a working definition. And I think, again, um, going over the reason that we're talking about surprise bills is, again, um, the lack of distinction between surprise bill, you know, cost sharing, balance billing, and the like. So continuing this discussion and looking at our working definition. Um, of a surprise medical bill refers to circumstances where an insured individual receives a bill for services from a provider of ground ambulance services 
after the patient inadvertently receives services from an out-of-network provider or supplier, including in emergency situations where the patient has no ability to consent to a ground ambulance transport. Um, you, you'll see here that um, we're focusing, actually focusing on a surprise bill in an emergency ground ambulance or just in a ground ambulance situation. Um, one of the things that I thought about in my mind as we are talking about this definition is, um, you know, getting in there that this relates to people who are insured. But one of the other things that I began um, to struggle with was this idea of whether a ground ambulance entity is a provider or a supplier. So I would appreciate some attention on those terms um, as we discuss this definition. Um, so who wants to go first? I'll start, um, Raj. Okay. I, wanted, um, I want to um, um, articulate a statement here that CMS made regarding what a surprise or an unexpected, what a surprise bill is. And they specifically indicate um, in, on the, on the, in the No Surprise and Surprise Billing and Protecting Consumers under the current No Surprises Act is, and this is what they say, in many cases, the out-of-network provider could bill consumers for the difference between the charges the provider billed and the amount paid by the consumer's health plan. This is what is currently defined as balance bill. The unexpected balance bill is called a surprise bill. And so it's a difference between the cost share, the co-payment, the deductible, that is the responsibility. It is the unexpected bill from a balance bill, which is currently defined as the difference between the bill charge and the allowed amount as we already have currently. And we're talking in legalese, and I know we'll get to the whole disclosures for the consumers and things like that to make it make it simple for them, but that is actually currently already defined by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services under the current No Surprises Act piece of it. And okay. so I think that may be a good reference point for us to start at. And then does this need some more consumer friendly? But that's my, um, that would be my comments on mm -hmm. Surprise Bill. Asabel, which rule are you reading from? The first IFR? <laughs> That's a good question, Raj. Um, I will tell you. Yeah, Asbel, I think that came from a CMS fact sheet, actually, because I correct. recall seeing the same language. That um, is a fact sheet on June 14th of 2023. All right. I'll be able to find that with no problem. All right. How do folks feel about that definition? Do we think that gets it, Pete? Uh, it, I was just going to go, and I think it may be the same definition you guys just were looking at. It's in the CMS glossary, and it says surprise billing is when a provider bills a patient for the balance remaining on the bill that the patient's plan does not cover. This amount is the difference between the actual billed amount and the allowed amount. Okay. I, I remember that and I'm trying to remember why we didn't um, focus on that one. Um, but Pete, give me that site that you said in the healthcare.gov glossary. It, it's the CMS glossary. CMS glossary. And, and I can send you the actual link and I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, those might work better for me. I, the, the last part of your working definition, the consent issue, I think is not necessary, not necessary okay. and may be confusing. Okay. All right. And, and do we, uh, did we previously in allowed amount is, is the cost sharing already defined as being included in the allowed amount so that that kind of clears up that final mm. final piece where it's not just the insurance company's 
actual payment, but it's, you know, in allowed amount, but it's also any um, expected cost share. Right. So here we did um, the healthcare.gov glossary um, re references payment allowance. Should we add an allowed amount here for consumer benefit? Or do you think payment allowance covers it, Sean? I, I guess for us internally, for the time being, it, it probably all makes sense. I just think at, at some point uh, we may need to clarify that cost sharing is a part of that allowed amount when it refers specifically to um, the uh, unexpected bill or balance bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Noted that. Okay. So we're going to go back and um, kind of start with that definition from the fact sheet. Um, and we'll have that in our next iteration of these. Raj, this is Gam. Yep. Just a, a quick comment um, where you deleted has no ability to consent to ground ambulance transport. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just kind of jogged my memory about something. And maybe this is worth just inserting a, a comment in the Word file that we may want to define uh, implied consent. Hmm. Okay. And I, I, I don't offer you a, a definition at this, this point, but, you know, during emergency situations, obviously for you know, a lot, maybe even most uh, EMS patients' uh, care is being provided under implied consent. Okay. Thanks. That is a good call out. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Just checking my time here. I think we're doing okay. So the next one for discussion is. Ground Ambulance Emergency Medical Service and the Prudent Person Standard. So where to start with this one? Um, just to give the committee an eye into kind of how we came here, there was, we, we talked about needing a definition for a ground ambulance emergency medical service. We talked about needing a definition for an emergency service. And we talked about the Prudent Person Standard. So as we started to look at um, the different sources we're looking at, state statutes and the like, EMTALA, um, all of these things, um, especially as it relates to what is an emergency medical condition in ground ambulance, um, really kind of merged into one definition. Um, and so I wanna talk about that and whether we, this is real, where we really need a separate definition from for ground ambulance emergency medical service that is completely distinct from the prudent person standard or is what we're looking at in front of us um, going to be sufficient for our purposes. So um, if he doesn't mind me putting him on the spot, um, Pete, can you give us a little background for the benefit of, uh, of us and the public about the issue as it relates to ground ambulance emergency medical services and the prudent person standard? Absolutely, and, and California has got a very good definition in health and safety code section 1371.5. And essentially it, uh, it says that it, coverage for ambulance services is to be provided if either there was a medical emergency and the enrollee required ambulance service or the enrollee reasonably believed that the medical condition was an emergency medical condition and reasonably believed the condition required ambulance transport. The issue is, and we had this problem in California in the 90s, is the insurance company started using discharge diagnosis to deny ambulance claims. If, for example, um, I called 911 because I was having chest pain and we transported the patient and their discharge diagnosis was undetermined, the um, insurance company in many cases would deny it as not medically necessary because there was no medical emergency determined. So we put prudent layperson language in place back in the 90s um, 
Assembly Bill 984 that put this prudent layperson standard, which is now, again, it's in Health and Safety Code section 1371.5. Um, and I think that is a very good and a very um, defendable definition that allows the patient to call 911 when they reasonably believe that they're having a medical emergency. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I was just pulling up um, the Cal statute. So, so Raj, while you're doing that, I do want to opine on just a bit of what Pete said here, that if a patient calls 911, um, it's defined from that perspective. I think we also need to look at that a patient could be in an emergency room and want transport or getting transport to another hospital. And in their mind, that to them is critical and an emergency as well. If, a, if the current emergency room cannot handle their services and need to get them out for a higher level of care. So think a cardiac cath or uh, something like that that's not provided. And they may not necessarily call 911. Somebody else may do it. A doctor may do it. A nurse may call and want that patient transported out immediately. Not that's sometimes where the confusion gets. Does prudent lay person apply there? Is that an emergency? What is that? And I know that's probably going to come up in some dialogue as we talk about others. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would caution us when we're looking at this to tie it specifically to just 911 um, when we start modifying the definitions of prudent lay person. Okay. Yes, Gary, I'd like to add in um, 911 or equivalent. Uh, where I work, we try to keep the nursing homes out of the 911 system because the fire department doesn't respond with us. And uh, so we give them a seven digit number that they can call. And um, it's equivalent to 911, but it doesn't actually go through a 911 call. But okay. uh, still, this would apply. Okay. Anything else? Regina. See, Regina, yeah. Raj, I want to second what Gary said, um, and as well as well, we need to separate that. So it does need, I like adding or equivalent. I think that covers it. Okay, great. All right. Anything else? Um, yeah, I, the one thing that gives me a little bit of angst on, on this is when you say was required to treat. So does that mean that the EMS was required to treat or the emergency department or from a, and really, and, and I would like uh, Pete to reread that um, definition again, again, because I, I think I liked it, but I didn't catch all of it. But it's not just treat, but it's also evaluate. You know, we, we want the, pa the patient needs to be evaluated. So I, I worry if you just put treat in that you're going to limit it to patients who got something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the definition is, again, coverage of ambulance services is there was a medical emergency and the enrollee required ambulance service or... The enrollee reasonably believed that the medical condition was an emergency medical condition and reasonably believe, believed the condition required ambulance transport services. Yeah, that, I, I like that. Okay. And just so we'll have it, I am just going to paste that definition in right here. So we'll have that. Might want to... So that's what the Cal statute looks like. And this has been very, very successful for the, the folks here in California. Solved the issue right away. Took us three years, but. Okay. Ted? 
Yeah, I'm thinking the word maybe should be assessed to match the rest of the Medicare because there is that assessment component right. when EMS arrives instead of um, evaluate to require to assess and treat, which would then would match the rest of the language. So we would go with assess here. Okay. And I think it's and or treat. Okay. All right, so what we'll work on is probably um, coming back with something that is conglomeration of the California statute with the pinpoints that we kind of worked on today. Suzanne? Thank you, so, um, and good morning, everyone. Is, maybe I missed this. So the last part where it says include ground transportation of the patient to a hospital or other medically appropriate destination. When we're talking about other medically appropriate destination, does that, I know this might seem like oversimplifying it, but does it mean or include inner facility transportation or is it alternate sites for care? That's a good question. I don't know. Okay. Um, we can just put that in a list to follow up because interf- um, and I'm not sure, Pete, when you rolled this out, if it was just to handle the the you know the 911 ground emergency side of the business, or did it capture that inner facility piece, which may be someplace else in here that I've got to catch up on reading, but um, yeah. This was 911 specific. Okay, but but I agree with what you guys are saying, you know, from Sean on that, uh, you know, we need to do that assessment part versus just treatment or transport and and mm-hmm. yeah there's t- times that it's a destination that is different than a, a 911 we were just dealing with emergency transportation when we got uh, this put in place. Okay, thank you. I think this is what Suzanne Suzanne brings up that I originally indicated at the very beginning here about this going through 911 or equivalent. This is where the confusion currently is. And I know this came up in one of our subcommittees and I believe Patricia brought this up from the behest of a consumer as well. And some of the complaints that they might receive on inner facility transfers where they think this is an emergency. Why is it being coded as a non-emergency or is it being downcoded from someone or another? And this is where we that construct we need to understand in the eyes of the consumer and their belief. If I had a heart attack at a level three and I need to get out for a cardiac cath or whatever, is that still an emergency or not? Depending upon how quickly they responded or what have you, what is that continuation of it through the eyes of the consumer? And so I, I just want to make sure we bring that because I think it needs to be addressed. Okay. Sean. Thanks. Um, I think one of my comments, uh, actually, as Bill just covered, um, but the other one is we also might want to look at um, the CMS prudent layperson language, uh, just make a note to kind of pop that up, review it, see how they all, hopefully they should all line up together. Um, But I think we can do that as we move forward. Um, Neither one are ideal when it comes to the point Asbel just made about inner facility transfers to higher level of care that are often urgent in nature and may not be initiated uh, by a by a lay person. So I think that's a that's another subject to tackle. Okay. Okay. That's great discussion. I'm just checking our time here. I think we're doing okay. So look at there, emergency interfacility transport. Um, 
So as Bill, I know we've already talked about um, the confusion with interfacility transports. So I think we can just kind of jump into this one. Um, what we came up with was the transport of a patient experiencing an emergency medical condition from one healthcare facility to another as ordered by a qualifying physician or other treating healthcare professional. Um, I will go ahead and admit here that this is one that we really just had to come up with. Um, here you know, is where starting from, you know, what was out there. But go ahead, as Bill. Yeah, here is where I'm thinking that we, it'd really be nice to get a lot of public comment on this. And I know we're probably going to be open up public comment in the next 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but I really feel unless because emergency can have a lot of subjectivity to it. And that's what a lot of discussion has happened over the last few months. Um, emergency versus non-emergency, and maybe we need to have, and I believe in the definitions that you have further on, we're talking about scheduled and unscheduled, and I'm not wondering if it's more appropriate to talk about interfacility within the context of scheduled and unscheduled from a consumer's perspective. So if we're going to ensure patients are protected against a balanced bill, at what time, at what point does it become scheduled and unscheduled? So scheduled and unscheduled can have very objective terms. Um, that happens in other healthcare sectors already. When you get into emergency, non-emergency, and we start into this prudent layperson's definition of an emergency and general from the California to whatever, while it does clean up some, it can still be interpretive. Um, and so that would be something that um, when I'm looking at this piece of it that we might want to consider as well as a committee. Okay. Suzanne. Thank you. I should just, we make a note about, you know, when I read this definition and I, and I, I hear what, you know, how, you, how this came about and I agree with Asbel as to, you know, working for ske into scheduled or non-scheduled, but I do think one thing that's key here that isn't always understood um, on the consumer side and sometimes even on the healthcare provider side is that you're, you're moving somebody someplace else uh, because you can't do it there. You know, they're going to another facility that meets, you know, is most appropriate to meet their needs. And I don't, so I just think that that, you know, should be weighted. I mean, my opinion is somehow that should be captured in that conversation. It isn't uh, by choice is a whole different conversation, but by need is is a focus we shouldn't take on. Agreed. My opinion. Okay, Patricia. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we the scheduled versus non-scheduled might be one way to solve it, but um, you know I agree with Suzanne that there the 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 issue of the patient who either came from the community or their home to the hospital and then finds out that they can't get the services that they need um, at that place where they were taken. You know that's one situation where interfacility is definitely needed. Then there's the situation where a patient might already be in the hospital. For example, the you know pregnant woman is goes to her local hospital. She's had an uncomplicated pregnancy. She has she delivers the baby. All of a sudden, there's need for a NICU that that local hospital doesn't have, or some other kind of specialty services for that for that brand new baby, or for the mother who's now um, maybe experiencing some kind of trauma that. The local hospital can't provide. So, you know, in that kind of same situation, I'm feeling like that mother would be calling 911, right? Like, I've got to get my either sick infant or myself, you know, somewhere safer that can actually give me the care that I need. So, scheduled, not scheduled, I don't, you know, I don't know if that captures those moments, but those are certainly the situations where people find themselves and they are. They too, just like the, calling 911, they're not scheduling that ambulance service. So that is being scheduled by whatever facility is um, caring for them right now. So the patient is set in the same situation and you know potentially experiencing that um, out of network transportation that was decided for them. 
So I just think we have to think about some of those situations and make sure we're acknowledging um, the risk of a surprise out of network bill for folks. Thanks. Thank you. Pig. I think a key point of also what Kat, uh, Patricia's talking about is the statements on a physician is actually ordering this because yes. they're the ones determining that the facility doesn't have the capabilities for the baby or for um, other conditions that the patient needs. So again, you have a obviously a higher qualified uh, physician making those determinations and requesting the service uh, to be done. Right. Ted, on that point, um, we have in the definition as ordered by a qualified physician or other treating health care provider. Um, other treating health care provider is really, you know, our, our language. Um, how does this work? The, the question that was in my mind, is, is this sufficient to cover or does it happen like things like nurse practitioners may order an emergency interfacility transport? I mean, um, certainly in urban and rural settings, that's a big piece of it, right? You'll have a physician, but you've got nurse practitioners and others that are really determining a lot of that um, requirements that the patient needs, treating the patient, also identifying where the other locations the patient can be transported to and where those needs are for either stroke centers or NICU centers. So um, it's especially teams that have to be identified. So that's why you've got, um, uh, I think, a multi-layered approach within the hospital systems where it's not just a physician, but it takes, you know, quite a bit of that to uh, work through as a patient's being determined where they need to go. Right. So do we think that this phrase, other treating healthcare provider is sufficient to capture everyone we need to capture? I also say it's maybe, uh, there's sometimes a delegated authority that occurs from a physician to the other healthcare provider. So there's, it can also be in that kind of uh, tone. But that's not in every state. So, right, that's the problem. It's not so every spot in, has in, it. In most states, nurse practitioners are independent, licensed independent. Mm -hmm providers so they don't have any delegated authority um in in the pas in some states are and some aren't so it just i think depends and certainly i think ted's absolutely right that um that uh you know you have places where there's a uh a, a, a provider like a nurse practitioner in the facility you know like a rural emergency department and they're the one calling for the transfer Okay. Yeah. So I, the other interesting thing, having spent before, right now I'm the medical director of um, of a nine of nine one one system, but spent a fair amount of my earlier career as a medical director of a critical care and a facility system. I mean, you can have you can have transfers that would fall under the definition of scheduled, but are still necessary medically. Like a patient is in a, in a um, suburban or rural hospital where a certain procedure is not available and it doesn't need to be done that day, but maybe it needs to be done tomorrow or the next day so that they, they would schedule the transfer to be more timely with the procedure. Certainly some orthopedic procedures mm -hmm. might fall under something like that. Um, and so um, my concern is still that, uh, that the patient has this unmet medical need that needs to be, um, needs to be taken care of and that, um, you know, in a, that um, they shouldn't necessarily have the risk uh, associated with that just because it was scheduled for two days from now. There are also cases in like the neonatal world where that might happen too. Just to build on Patty's uh, example. <laughs> okay. So if we could at, at this point, because I'm, I think I'm hearing that the working definition is a decent starting point. We need to look at our um, bullet points here, but at this point, let's go down to 
scheduled and unscheduled requests. Again, these are ones that we, we really just came, came up with um, because as we research this, we, we now know why there's so much confusion um, because we could not come up with a um, existing definition for scheduled and unscheduled. So how do we feel about these working definitions and where do we need to start? So I think that we could probably take the, the, the context around the No Surprises Act and the current notice and consent provisions as they currently define to current other healthcare providers when they can actually do notice and consent. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about should we allow and is it applicable in our situation as ground. I'm talking about in general, if you look at the notice and consent provisions and when they occur, there's time frames that are given. And so, you know, if it's an appointment that was scheduled within 72 hours, mm -hmm. you know, there's some definitions around there. And I'm thinking if I was going to look at it in the context of a scheduled or unscheduled, it's going to be in a time frame. What is a time frame? Is it three days? Is it five days that you consider scheduled? If it, then it would be unscheduled. And then that would correlate with something. So if I was going to look at scheduled versus unscheduled, it would be something similar to how notice and consent is currently done um, because in some positions the patient isn't informed they there's a transport whether it was a day later because it was a part of their condition for higher level of care could have been mm -hmm. higher level of care but it was two days before they could get to that higher level of care if they didn't get to that higher le level of care they would medically deteriorate and turn back into uh, a, a 911 call so it's a part of that could possibly be in context of post stabilization so mm -hmm. if I was going to look at this that's kind of where I would start first to see is there a general theme that could be developed into um, a scheduled or unscheduled if we pursue this venue as well one question I had is this concept of scheduled and unscheduled as it relates to an emergency or a non-emergency. You'll see that just by based on what we came up with. Um, and I think what I'm understanding is that scheduled and unscheduled isn't always about an emergency or you know, an, an emergency situation. Can you talk to me a little bit about scheduled and unscheduled as it relates to emergency services or those emergency transports? So, so I would I would usually look at this in context, and I think um, Ritu gave a really, really good example of someone maybe being on the floor. They were admitted for a reason, and they started to, and they needed ah. uh, services from some other facility, you know, or, you know, sometimes they're coming out of an emergency room, going for a higher level of care. Oftentimes, more than not, that's a part of it. The doctor is going to order if they don't get the services. But say, for instance, they're on a floor, they need to be scheduled tomorrow. But if they don't get that, critic, there's going to be a critical issue begin to happen. Mm -hmm. In that instance, it could be a continuation of an unscheduled environment because can you get to it? They're scheduling, case management is looking at it. It may take them seven or eight hours or 10 hours to locate another facility to take the patient. And mm -hmm. so sometimes if you put a time frame parameter in, because people have played around with six hours or eight hours or nine hours, but there are situations in there. And if you come with a definitive, I like to go back to how we look at ambulance in the world of repetitive transports, which we have repetitive non-scheduled uh, or a repetitive scheduled uh, non-emergency ambulance transportation for dialysis. And yeah. basically it's, those are things that are scheduled. They're continuing on, you know, it's going to happen on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, 30, you know, it's going to happen at 10 o'clock or two o'clock. And it's a repetitive happening all of the time, but is really a, is it, can you really do anything around notice and consent provisions for a patient that's in a hospital and the doctor needs to discharge them quickly, whether they're going to rehab or something like that. And they've got an hour or two hours and the ambulance needs to respond um, and be active and ready, just like they are in a 911 situation. Mm -hmm. So is there any difference in cost associated? Is there any difference with, it, with anything else, whether it was a 911 call that you needed to have 24 set, or you, it was a discharge to go to rehabilitation or rehab for something where a case manager calls or an emergency says, we need to get this patient moved now. 
And so that's kind of the context that I sometimes gets a little unclear where it becomes mm -hmm. very subjective and different ways that it's defined, which then produces a balanced bill to a consumer that doesn't understand. And they look at it and they're like, well, if this was an emergency, if I didn't go there, this would have happened. And so that to me is kind of where I think there's confusion mm -hmm. and we need to define that. Okay. Okay. That helps. I, th I think we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Patricia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah. And so not to make it any more complicated than it already is, but, you know, the issue of you know, if we're making this distinction, it worries me a little bit that there might be, you know, some limits to the surprise billing protections. But if there's only one ambulance company that provides the transportation in that community, scheduled, not scheduled, whatever, the patient is still going to be subjected to that out of network bill if that one ambulance is not part of their network. So, um, who who's making the decision to transport them, how far in advance, whatever. Um, it's still a situation if there's only that one company and it is out of network that you would be facing an out of network surprise bill that you have no choice over. You can't make the choice to go in network. Um, so I think we just have to keep that in mind. You know, I'm not sure exactly how we might use some of these definitions, but that's um, that's just something that will be out there that that I'll just keep raising, and we'll talk about it later this afternoon in our presentation. Okay. All right, Rhonda. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say I think we need to be really cautious with certain time frames, and I know that you know in our ED we can call thirty hospitals trying to get a patient transferred out, and sometimes we have to board a patient in the ED for multiple days, but they're still needing a higher level of care. So I just think we have to be really cautious about putting time frames around what would be allowed and what wouldn't, whether it's scheduled or unscheduled. Okay. Okay. Anybody else on this scheduled and unscheduled? Looks like we have a lot of work to do here. All right. So now I'm going to go back up um, and go to our next, which would be the post stabilization ground ambulance services. So if someone could give us some background on why we are addressing this definition, that would be helpful. What is the issue with both post stabilization and ground ambulance services? Asbel? Oh, Rhonda. Well, I, I was just going to say, I think that this goes more towards the scheduled. Um, so the patient has been stabilized and maybe they need to uh, be discharged to a rehab facility or back to a skilled nursing facility. Um, they're not able to have uh, private transportation. So I think that in my mind that this goes along towards the scheduled uh, ambulance service. Okay. So the only thing is, and, I, and I'm not sure who made the suggestion on this post-stabilization ground ambulance, but I believe this CFR reference is tied to that Intala piece where the patient came in for an emergency medical condition. And then this is a part of the post-stabilization part of that, Raj. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to what we're talking through the emergency interfacility transfer. Okay. The patient is being, I, I, if, if this is the right reference, this could be almost synonymous or closely aligned with what we're talking through on the other definition of emergency interfacility um, as well. That's I, true. I, I believe that's what that 438 is, but I'm not sure. I'll have to go back and look at it. And then this gets into existing No Surprises Act implications that I think we would want to just be, be cognizant of that, you know, under, under the existing statute, the No Surprises Act. Um, does apply to many post stabilization services, um, and there's there's been questions I know at least in in two states um, where state departments of insurance have interpreted um, inter or intra facility transfers um, as post stabilization services, where then they're trying to apply 
no surprises act uh, rules to ground ambulances in the intra facility transfers. Um, and I think at least one where they've tried to apply that in inter facility is claiming that it falls under the no surprises act uh, emergency services definition that includes post stabilization services. So there's just a lot of a lot of interplay there that I think we would we would we're going to in any recommendations need to kind of note where we're talking about existing no surprises act regulations and where we're kind of going into new territory. Okay. Ted has his hand raised. I'm yeah, uh, I think just also just making sure we realize that there's there were some previous statements. It's when a person actually needs an ambulance for transportation. You know, so this is somebody that needs oxygen, needs medical monitoring. You know, there's components where it is that it's, you know, it's it's uh, well above that claim of a you know potentially a patient needing to be discharged in a personal vehicle. There's a reason why the person is going between facilities. In a um, uh, and, and and how the states obviously manage that also within some of the rules on be it oxygen, um, uh, being able to move a patient appropriately for hip fractures, you know things like that that still require uh, true patient treatments in ambulances and monitoring. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? All right, do you dare what's next? We've done scheduled and unscheduled. Raj, while we're doing yes. that in the last 30 minutes as we continue to keep deliberating, I'm gonna ask PRI to kind of open the chat box. So if any of the public has any comment, they can start making comments and then we mm -hmm. can see if there's anything that we're missing um, in conjunction prior to September 5th as well. All right. Great. So the next one we have before us is a definition of community paramedicine. Um, I think at this point, our goal um, with dealing with this definition um, is it, still in flux. But what I'd like to do is invite Gary to talk to us a little bit about community paramedicine and um, basically why we're looking at this today. Gary? Yeah, so community paramedicine is a not covered service under Medicare currently, even though many insurance plans and Medicaid managed care uh, have it covered. So it always results in a balanced bill. Um, after the subcommittee got this list this morning, um, I emailed the subcommittee back with a definition that went through an international consensus process that covered okay. several different countries. Um, and uh, it is a community paramedic provides person-centered care in a diverse range of settings that addresses the needs of the community. Their practice may include provision of primary health care, health promotion, disease management, clinical assessment, and needs-based interventions. They should be integrated with interdisciplinary health care teams, which aim to improve patient outcomes through education, advocacy, and health system navigation. So it's a little more expansive than the one we have, and maybe we could look at uh, merging them or um, using uh, the consensus definition that was done in a research project and published. Okay. And so Gary, just to reiterate um, what you shared with us, um, again, community, um, paramedical professionals are currently, I understand, Gary, generally not compensated um, to the extent that they, um, you know, work in connection with ground ambulances, or is that true, you know, do, do they have a, a role in a life outside of a ground ambulance service? Yeah, so the services can be provided by an ambulance service or in other models. We currently in the United States have direct-to-consumer community paramedicine models. An example, I don't know all of the systems, there's several of them, but MedArrive would be an example of that. And um, some of those systems outside of an ambulance service are direct contracting with insurers. Some of them get uh, lists of patients that a Medicaid managed care plan wants seen because they've gone to an emergency room and have never had a primary care physician 
visit. Um, and so it can be in a lot of models. There's hospital at home. Uh, there's just a lot of models where the, uh, uh, the care is provided. Um, but because it's not a Medicare covered service, if you're um, on Medicare uh, and you need and use these services, then um, you get a full bill. Right. And so I want to make um, make clear for the for everybody listening why we're discussing community paramedicine. Again, we're going to get into um, how balanced bills relate to these type of thing when we talk about coverages and disclosures and the like. But here, community paramedicine, my understanding of why we're speaking to this is because the lack of coverage for these services is often going to result in a ground ambulance responding and eventually um, not necessarily getting getting paid. And, and Gary, I feel like I'm messing this up royally. So please jump in here. But I wanna make sure that the public understands why we're talking about community paramedicine that is currently not a public service and how that can lead or exacerbate the fact that it's not covered, how this could contribute to balance bills for ground ambulance. Yeah, is I anybody think so. able to better, Gary, can you better make that connection for me? Yeah, I, um, I think it did a pretty good job. Um, not having access to it may or may not result uh, in an ambulance being mm -hmm. dispatched. But um, so for example, um, they may get a referral from a physician, the community paramedicine service may get a referral from a physician to see a patient and do specific things that might include things like lab draws, um, if they can be treated at home to get their IV antibiotics, uh, those those kinds of things. Um, but it's non-covered, and that's so that's the patient protection piece here. Um, it's covered in many places in insurance companies and um, especially in Medicaid managed care at risk um, organizations uh, favor community paramedicine. Mm -hmm. There's a, a hundred uh, research papers on how it reduces healthcare downstream costs. And uh, so it's well supported in research, um, mm -hmm. but because it's a non-covered benefit, the uh, patient protection is that the patient 100% of the time would get a full bill um, um, because it's not covered at all. So the, the um, recommendation is to make it a covered service. Um, and so that can protect the patient from getting those bills. Okay, appreciate it, Gary. So now I'd like to move to the paramedic intercept. I think this is um, another definition that we're looking at for similar reasons that we're looking um, to the last definition we discussed. Um, Ted, could you talk to us a little bit about this definition of paramedic intercept and why it's relevant to our um, deliberations and activities? Yeah, communities, um, number of states, it's actually in, uh, in some Medicare list in New York. I was actually practicing paramedic there um, in New York and ran the paramedic intercept model where you've got um, paramedics in fly cars and QRVs or Ford Explorer type vehicles uh, responding out to meet um, incoming ambulances to the potentially more urban centers. So you have it where you've got either EMT, EMT uh, ambulances or volunteers, and it provides a higher level of care for those uh, communities. So you may have a 45 minute or an hour transport time and the paramedic will actually intercept um, with that ambulance and then upgrade that ambulance from BLS to ALS. And it gives the capabilities then for, um, you know, obviously reimbursement for that type of clinical care it's being done. Um, that's just one of the options there. Okay. Pete. It, and yet, it, this is, uh, you know, an old definition that was really desi designed for a specific issue, you know, the upstate New York issue, but it falls into one of the other definitions that, uh, that I had, or the terms I had put in, the ALS first response where the paramedic intercept ALS first response, it's we've got ALS services being provided by an entity that doesn't provide the ambulance transport. 
And, and we need, and, and Asbel and I had a pretty long and, and I thought a good conversation on it to kind of outline the, the needs here, because in many cases, this results in a bill being issued to the patient that is not covered by insurance, because if you have a fire department that provides that ALS first response service, um, it's a non-covered service and then paramedic intercept is only covered in upstate New York. And I don't even know if that applies anymore based on some changes they've made to allow billing, but we have to evolve the system and the reimbursement to keep place with it. Sorry, the systems evolve. We need the reimbursement to keep pace. ALS first response needs to be de is defined and recognized. And we need to come up with a mechanism that we can get NPIs uh, the national provider identification for these non-transport agencies that are providing paramedic level care, but not ambulance transport. And I think that's a conversation that we need to continue to have uh, so that patients aren't getting bills that insurance companies in many cases will not cover because they say they have no NPI. Right. Okay, so now I, I want to make sure we have at least, um, you know, 30 minutes for our public comment. What we have left are treatment in place, cost, and, and price. Um, treatment in place, um, this is, again, another um, definition that we're talking about as a subject that often leads to a consumer getting a bill, because many times treatment in place, if a ground ambulance does not actually transport the patient somewhere um, to that healthcare facility, to that hospital, um, my understanding is that they are not paid. Um, so this often results in a bill. Does anybody else wanna talk a bit about treatment in place and, and, and why it's important to our work today? Yeah, I will, because I know that this is probably gonna come up in some of the coverages discussions and disclosure of non-coverages, but I think we probably need to expand treatment in place. I believe you're taking it from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that we had them present to the committee several times, that this could be synonymous with treatment, no transport. Um, and I know NHTSA and NIMSA's data will talk about like treatment, no response, treatment, no transport, treat and release, things like that. So we probably need to, um, very similar to how you have that bill charge, Mm -hmm. um, and it includes, it could be include this and this and this, and it's referred to as whatever. We probably want to do something in there if we're going to come up with a definition of whenever an ambulance responds or somebody calls 911 or the equivalent, there mm -hmm. is a response. Somebody shows up on scene, assesses. It could be referred to in several different ways, but it's in general, it's a non covered service. Okay. Not all the time, but in general, it is. Right. And Asbel, do I recall correctly that whatever um, flexibilities were put in place during the public health emergency have now expired? For the limited treatment in place provision that was passed into the public health emergency, the ET3 or that emergency triage transport treat, sorry, treat, ET3. Trans, treat what uh, uh ET3, <laughs> triage what, treatment and transport triage there we go sorry triage treatment transport um has it will expire 12 31 okay. um and so th that is a provision if you were part of this demonstration program there was some coverage uh portions of that under the current medicare program that that will expire as of 12 31. But in generally speaking, when we start talking about is there any instances where patients might receive a bill for non covered services, this potentially could be one of them. There, we are getting subject matter experts, Raj, of course, that are coming to talk uh, from some plans that are covering certain things and why they cover it and in what instances they currently cover it. So the committee can kind of understand that piece as well when we start formulating either findings or recommendations, just depending if it's within our charge or not to make a recommendation. Right. Okay. So I wanna move quickly to cost and price. Um, oh, wait, wait, you, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry Rita, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just, I just uh, 
want to reiterate something I brought up and we've talked about this at various other uh, in our other meetings, but from a, the physician community side, um, this is, uh, we're very supportive of the concept, obviously very, uh, a large percentage of our patients don't get transported, but we also feel like this is really an important place to have strong guardrails around quality and medical oversight. Um, okay. Okay. Anything else, Ritu? All right. So quickly, um, our last two definitions are cost and, and price. And of course, these two definitions that we, we originally focused on, again, so that we can make sure we're all speaking the same language. Um, this first definition, this working definition, is um, basically we would basically recommend that the costs that were recorded and defined in the Medicare ground ambulance data collection system, um, you know, be adopted for purposes of our defining cost. Um, is there someone on the line that can talk about those cost elements? I, I did fail to paste those in. Um, could somebody talk to us a bit about that and um, what those, you know, representative lists of those costs that are um, considered in this system? And I don't well, know maybe I'll jump in, uh, Raj. Uh, basically, uh, you you have you have buckets that include um, all of all of the things that go into the infrastructure of operating an ambulance serv service to be ready to respond. So things like your personnel, uh, vehicles, facilities, uh, administrative team overhead. And then you have uh, a certain amount of incremental cost uh, that would be incurred on uh, a case by case basis, such as your disposable medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, uh, et cetera. Um, and, um, and then for accounting purposes, you have uh, costs such as depreciation of assets and other things that would, that would work in there so that you end up with a comprehensive look at everything, all the financial resources it takes to be ready to respond to a call, which is a key component there as volume can vary considerably and ambulances are different from, let's say, a a clinic uh, that maybe you can schedule a full day or if you only need to work three days a week in a community because that's all the volume there is you don't have your staff in there the other two days and, and you shut down or you only rent a facility for a part-time basis things like that so ambulance service mm -hmm. cost reporting uh, data collection excuse me to be correct on the terminology is really about understanding that cost of readiness and then looking at how that relates to the revenue uh, generated by the volume that a community creates for that ambulance service mm -hmm. to come up with a, an actual cost per service rendered. Um, you need to look at both halves of the equation. Right. And others, please chime in. I'm this is Pete. I think we just, you know, to, to, to build off that, we need to continue to recognize that, that is just identified. We don't get to choose when we're going to be in service. We have to be in service at 2 a.m. in the morning, and we have to be in service at 2 p.m. in the morning, we, or 2 p.m. In the, in the afternoon. We have to cover Christmas, and we have to cover the 27th of September. It doesn't matter. And that's the thing is there's requirements for the provision of service. 24 hours and there's response time requirements and there's penalties. There isn't just, you know, the, the, the ambulance services, the, the private companies in particular, they're subject to penalties when they cannot meet the response time requirement. So they have to ensure that they have the ability to do it or it causes problems in, in the system. And that's a cost of readiness that, uh, that's key. Yeah. Yeah. 
And also that costs are different um, by community and by requirements that um, counties or states or even local operation requirements are set up for. So how many ambulances cover a geographic area may be different in one community than another. Um, number of uh, paramedics potentially on an ambulance may be different in one community than another. So you end up with somewhat of a different cost structure among some of the providers, um, but that usually is customized quite often for what that community's need or requirements have been established over a period of time. All right, Gary. Yeah, and I'd also like to point out again that um, the rural communities often don't get enough reimbursement to have staff, paid staff, and uh, that's an issue as um, re recruitment and retention of volunteers is getting very worse. And so there's a consumer protection hook about here, whether you have an ambulance service at all. And I think there's also a piece that relates to negotiating contracts with insurers. Um, oftentimes, those are presented as take it or leave it. And uh, there's no opportunity for the ambulance company to open their books and say, here's our cost. And now let's talk about um, the reimbursement based on our cost, uh, rather than accepting Medicare rates or 150% of Medicare or whatever it might be. The um, negotiation between the ambulance company and the insurer needs to occur and should be based on the costs that Pete and others um, Tron um, described really well. Thanks, Gary. That, that's the exact point I wanted to make sure that we made for everyone here listening to the meeting, is that the reason that costs are important to our activity is because of the current way that many ground ambulance services are reimbursed and the fact that they do not receive reimbursement um, for many of the um, services, resources on the transport like drugs and other medications. Um, so why this is important is if an ambulance services cannot cover its cost, the availability of that service to the public is threatened. So it, it seems that um, based on what we've been learning since this committee has, has been together, is that um, ambulance services are by and large reimbursed um, as a transport service. So you're kind of getting a base rate plus your mileage and everything that that ambulance service actually has to provide, whether it be because of state or local rules or federal rules, everything they have to provide has to be covered by whatever they're being reimbursed or maybe those costs are, are covered um, well, or not covered by going in the red. So I, I just wanted to make that point. And Sean, maybe you can make that point better than I can about why it's so important that we understand the cost um, incurred by different um, ambulance providers. Well, and I, and I think actually you just, you really did sum it up well. And I guess the only other thing I would add is that when we, when we talk about what those kind of requirements are that all get wrapped into that single base rate and mileage, um, those requirements are set by authorities who are looking at national standards and national practice models. And I think um, Ritu can probably speak to that, um, both as a system medical director, uh, regulator, and um, a physician in the, in the national EMS community that while there may be subtle, there may be some subtle differences between how a community um, treats a particular medical condition those are driven by looking at uh, national uh, best practice models and from medical systems around the country. Right. All right. So, so I think just Raj, from this perspective, we're, we're doing definition and we're getting caught in policy or whatever, but from the cost piece of it, I agree with Sean here that I think the Medicare ground ambulance that did a really good job and we can put those categories in there of identifying what is cost for ground ambulance providers. And then we can then take that to use for policy recommendations. Perfect. 
All right, very quickly, we're going to go to price. Price is one of those definitions, again, that we um, wanted to arrive at so that we're all speaking the same language. We started with a dictionary definition of price, and we came up with the amount of money a supplier accepts or agrees to accept in exchange for providing ground ambulance medical transport services to a patient inclusive of related charges, including gas, mileage, drug supplies, et cetera. Um, this one, I don't know if we wanna get in too much here because I really wanna get to the public comments on these. So if we can, um, for, for this price, this is one that we'll handle offline, but um, for purposes of the public and public comment, know that we are trying to make sure we're using the same definition because a lot of time cost and price are mixed up. And so we're trying to make the distinction between what cost an ambulance supplier um, has to expend to provide the service. And the price is, is basically their sticker price for their services. Does anyone wanna say anything about price quickly? Seems to be a pretty straightforward one, Asbel. Now, the only thing I'm going to say is we'll we'll discuss it when we kind of move into the, the next half of what have you, but the inclusive of related charges, including gas mileage, drugs, or whatever, could be problematic okay. um, when we're looking at price. Got it. Okay. So I'll mark that so we can look at that. All right. And I know there's been people putting stuff in the chat, but just as a matter of time, um, because... Uh, Rod, we have about five minutes until we break. Oh, I apologize. I thought we were going to 11.45. Uh, well, we, we, we're we going until 11.30. Apologies. Okay, I've had no, this. No, no, not at all. Not at all. All right. So I have not been keeping um, reading the chat. So, Asbel, do we want to invite folks to weigh in? I will tell you this, we've been getting numerous comments in here. Some of them are related to definitions, of course, around um, uh, interfacility, emergency, immediate response. And there's been some really, really good comment here that I know we'll record and continue to deliberate on. Um, I believe there was a few comments, one from a service up in Illinois that talked about um, interfacility transfers that they do that are a lot unscheduled going for higher level of care. And I think we're kind of alluding to that in that emergency post stabilization, maybe higher level of care needs to be considered um, when we're thinking through those processes. I know there's been comments on if it, does it cover lower level of care, higher level of care. And so I think we've got some good comments here. Mm -hmm. um, going to suggest if you want to continue to provide input on that. Um, at the very end, don't forget, we will have more time for public comment. So that might give us some time here to Raj at the very end of the meeting this afternoon um, to maybe get some clarification if there's something in those comments that we need. But it looks like some of the comments coming in right now, we're covering and making points to continue to deliberate on. Yes, yes. And thank you for those. Um, very helpful. Sean, I see your hands raised as well. Yeah, just to, for the committee, will these comments be um, put onto some kind of format and redistributed to us so we can read them all later? I'll let Shaheen opine on that from the procedural standpoint, but yes, they will be. Shaheen? I know she's not there. They will be transcribed. Um, and they will be also available to the public um, as well as in the first public meetings. Yes, I, uh, this is Shaheen. I am um, uh, working on uh, getting another web request to post the meeting materials. And we expect to have these, uh, the slides and uh, the definitions, the working definitions posted early next week. Is, uh, Jim Riber just made a comment about Blue Cross refusing to contract with them because of the volume they have. I don't, um, so that's not part of the subcommittee that I'm on, but I wonder if that has come up with in the other subcommittee as an issue of the 
insurer refusing to to contract at all. Sure, and we will probably bring that up. Um, Gary, that's a, a really good public comment, but when we get to the very end, right now we're trying to keep the anything about definitions um, and anything that maybe we have not included um, in the definitions that we that would need to be clarified as we continue to deliberate around the the No Surprises Act charge. Um, so we do have another minute. One more question from Pete, and then we're going to turn this back over to Tara to start our break because we do have a presentation um, following right after. And we we want to be cognizant of our speakers. Pete, and thank you um, for for Raj. I had sent uh, some other words or, or some other terms for definition back in June. Um, how do you want to get those? You just want me to send them again as uh, as I have to consider? They were like ALS first response, alternate destination, direct reimbursement, et cetera. Um, how do you want me to get those back onto the, uh, the list of terms to be discussed? Yeah, just send those to me, Pete, and we'll add them on. Okay. I, I will get those set, set off to you when I uh, I get back. Okay. Thank you for that. Just as a general thing for the public as well, continue to submit your comment and do not forget about the written comments that are September um, by September the fifth as well. And we'll close the meeting with that as well. And I'll turn this over to Tara. Okay. Thank you, Raj. Um, we will now take a 10 minute break and resume at 1140 Eastern time with session two from our NIPSIS team. Welcome back. As a reminder, um, public comment will be available to be submitted via the chat feature at Pacific Times today. So we ask that you use the chat feature to submit your comments. And we will begin back with session two this morning. We have Eric Cheney and Clay Mann from the National EMS Information System. Eric Cheney is the program manager and Clay Mann is a principal investigator for the NIMSIS Technical Assistance Center. And with that, I will turn it over to Eric Cheney. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Thank you, ma'am. So we were provided with uh, some basic questions uh, to get started with, and we've pre prepared some responses to those questions. Uh, we'll start down through the, the presentation. If you have questions, um, I'm assuming we want to take those with the slide that we're looking at because, uh, you know, uh, some of these are going to get kind of detailed and you might forget. So please, let's take the questions uh, as you go. Just Just jump in and raise your hand or or uh, let us know what your question is and we'll move forward. Next slide, please. So overall, I just want to set Eric, you went on mute. Sorry, Nemesis is, thank you. Uh, Nemesis is, is a data standard that's established for all of the ambulance services in the United States. So the, the data that we're gonna talk about today when we talk about ground transport, it's defined the same way in the 14,000-ish ambulance services in the U.S. So everybody understands and recognizes that term, that definition. It's in a very detailed data dictionary that you can look at in nemsis.org. And I want to talk about the data set itself very quickly. Nemsis has about 585 data elements that could be captured at your agency level, your ambulance service. Some ambulance services capture the bulk of that data and some only capture 535 of those data elements. And a good example is billing. An ambulance service that does not bill would not capture the data for billing and would not use those data elements. Once that service identifies that data, they collect it. They then send a subset of that data to the state, often because of a statute that says you have to provide us with this data. And the state is usually very specific about what data elements they want to collect. So out of that 585, the state may only take 400-ish. It depends on the state. And in some cases, the state may take billing data, and in other cases, they may not. Then a subset of that state data is then sent to the National EMS Information System, the National Repository, 
and that's about 165 data elements, 185 elements, they come to the national level. So as we talk about data availability, regardless of what it is, some will be available at the agency level, some at the state level, and then some at the federal level. And it's based on statutory authorities or based on just the way the system was established in the beginning. And we'll talk about that as we go through. So we're gonna look at 2022 NEMSIS data for this, for this presentation. That represents about 51 million 400 EMS uh, activations throughout the United States. An activation is not necessarily a patient encounter. A lot of EMS responses result in no patient found or the patient is gone on arrival. There's numerous reasons why an activation would not lead to a patient, so don't confuse the two. 53 or 54 states and or territories provide data. All 50 states, three territories, and the District of Columbia. That's what makes up the 54 states that we have listed. So for the purposes of what we're going to talk about, this is the breakdown of all of those 51 million calls that you could look at in NEMSIS. There's ground transport, which is my understanding the purpose of this committee, 46 million activations. There's non-transport administrative, non-transport assistance, non-transport rescue, and then helicopter and fixed wing. For everything I'm gonna talk about from this point forward, it is specific to the 46 million number that's there, ground transport only. We've excluded everything else. I'm assuming that that's acceptable unless I hear that's unacceptable. Okay, excellent. So you can go to the next slide, I'm sorry. Can I ask a question, uh, Eric, yes, on that slide? Um, can you just confirm for me that the activations does not necessarily, so if I look at that ground transport number of 46 million, that does not equal patients from a consumer perspective. So it's that not is, like 46 million consumers may potentially get a balance bill, correct? That's correct. And that's what, as well, we're, that's exactly what we're going to look at in the next couple of slides. We're going to break that number down further for you to look at. But you are absolutely correct. Next slide, please. So if we look at that 46 million, we look at the percent of calls that are not transported. And what Clay has done is highlighted in red those categories that are resulting in non-transport. So these are the categories that you could select as having done something as a part of an activation. And if you go down about three quarters of the way, you'll see 33 million of those were patients treated and transported. So out of, out of the, the 46 million that we started with, 33 million resulted in a patient being treated and transported by EMS. So let's look at non-transport. That's the, the, the purpose of this particular slide. The result of patients, the, the, the bulk of patients where there was no transport were patients that refused evaluation or care. And patients can do that with EMS. We arrive on scene, a motor vehicle crash. Patient says, I'm fine. It was just a fender bender. Uh, law enforcement called the ambulance as a part of protocol or 911 dis dispatched it as part of protocol. We got there, patient refused evaluation, just get away from me, we don't need anything. That represented 4.6% or about 2 million. Then there's this patient treated and released AMA. That's that motor vehicle crash patient that hit their head on the steering wheel, has an obvious contusion. For whatever reason, the paramedic says, hey, look, you should really go to the hospital. You know, the airbags deployed, this, this met our, our protocol for transport, and the patient still says, nope, I'm fine, I'm not injured, I don't need anything. That would be an example of AMA. And then patient could have been treated. They had minor, minor abrasions, uh, they fell off a bicycle or something, EMS was called, and they provided some bandaging and bleeding. That represented about 1.71%. So you see the, the patient treated where we actually inter has interaction with the patient. We may or may not have provided treatment, but then the patient wasn't transported to the hospital. Those are the, the 4.6, 3.64, and 1.71. Let's, let's move up a little bit to the patient dead on scene. That's a possibility as well. 
And there's two categories there really for that. Patient's dead, at resuscitation was attempted, and patient was dead, and no resuscitation was attempted. And you see the breakdown there. In some cases, there's transport with that uh, resuscitation. In other words, the paramedic got there, they, they attempted resuscitation. They could have called it in the field. That's one option and say, okay, we're not even going to try to transport this patient to the hospital. Uh, we contacted May Control. This patient is, is dead at the house and, and we're no longer going to try to resuscitate the patient. The other category is they start resuscitation in the house. They transfer the patient to the, to the ambulance. They continue the resuscitation and route to the hospital. Um, that's another option as well. Then at the top, there are three categories for assist. Assist agency, assist public, and assist unit. These are really kind of catch-all categories that could be anything from standby at a rock concert to standby um, at um, a medical incident where there was a second ambulance requested, but there wasn't a need for care from that second ambulance um, to just a, a public assist type of call in general. There are the catch-all categories that result, may or may not result in a patient, most likely not, and there's no transport out of that, obviously. So th that's the breakdown of that 46 million calls or activations where there was no transport. And I'll stop there and take any questions. All right, if there's no questions, we'll go to the next slide. We can always come back. So then the percent of non-transport calls that received treatment in place that was discussed earlier, the treatment in place definition. So for patients that received treatment in place, but then were not transported, there are really two categories here. Patient was treated and released AMA, or the patient was treated and released per protocol, or medical direction would fall into that category too. And that represents about um, 25 or 2.5 million patients out of that 46 million active calls of activation or EMS activations. You can go to the next slide, please. So the most common reasons for non-transport, refused, expired, you know, um, care wasn't required. You see the, the public assist, the agency assist, and unit assist in the top categories. Again, most likely not a patient, um, just assist with other services. But the, the most common reasons for non-transport was the patient was dead on the scene and no resuscitation was attempted. So this person was obviously dead. The patient was dead and resuscitation was attempted, but then there was no transport. Paramedics follow protocol and ended the resuscitation attempt or use medical direction to end the resuscitation attempt. The patient was evaluated and determined that no treatment or transport was required by the EMS clinician or the patient refused care, whether that was against medical advice or whether it was um, just refused evaluation and care period. And then the patient was treated and released per protocol. So those are the most common reasons. Next slide, please. So where do the patients go who are being transported? This is a breakdown based on what the EMS clinician is able to enter today. And it's a slight variation in version 3.5 of NEMSIS that's rolling out right now. And I'll tell you about that in a second. So. The majority of our patients, 24 million, went to the hospital. That represents just over half went to the emergency department. The next biggest category is the percent that went 7.92% that went to the hospital but the non-emergency department bed. Now, this could be direct admit. This could be any one of the different categories, an OB, specific patient going to a specific floor, 
The next biggest category, obviously, is nursing home assisted living facilities. Then um, home. The other category is really a catch-all of uh, numerous things. We'd have to investigate that further. Um, urgent care centers and freestanding emergency departments. For example, uh, Maryland had a, a specific definition for freestanding emergency departments with very specific criteria of where a 911 um, emergency call could be responded to by an ambulance and transport that patient to that particular facility. So that's where our patients are being transported to. Next slide, please. So then the type of agency submitting records. So this goes back to the agency type by which the ambulance is responding from. Fire department based make up the largest percentage at 45%. So of all those EMS activations, that 46 million, 45% of those um, were, were responded to from fire department based ambulance services. Governmental non-fire made up the sec, uh, made up the third biggest category. I'm sorry, private, um, non-hospital based, 27% is the second biggest, followed by governmental non-fire, and then hospital based ambulance services. Those are staffed by career, or I'm sorry, I don't want to confuse people. They're staffed by volunteer or non-volunteer clinicians or a mixed service where a volunteer service may have paid people for part of the day or on the weekend shifts where it's difficult to get someone or weekday shifts where everybody in the community is working their normal job. So mixed is, is, is that mixture of paid and not paid. And then you have volunteer services and non-volunteer services. The bulk fall into the non-volunteer or paid services. And then mixed makes up the, the next biggest category. Next slide, please. So the, the variation of based on rural, super rural and frontier was given to us, but we use the USDA urbanicity codes. And if you look in the, the, the graphic with the map, you can see um, how basically the urbanicity influence codes are lengthy and we have condensed those down. That's the small map in, or the small spreadsheet in the very center. We have condensed those down into four categories for Nemesis. So our clinicians have four options, rural, I'm sorry, five. They can say they're a rural service or in a rural area, a suburban area, an urban area or frontier area. And again, that little Excel chart there in the center shows you how we categorize those four. And then they have an NA, no zip code reported. No zip code reported most frequently comes for a patient that's in um, a wilderness setting or on the interstate somewhere where the clinician may or may not be aware of what zip code they're actually in along that long rural stretch of roadway in the national park, so on and so forth. So that's why we have the no zip code reported. But we use rural, suburban, urban, and frontier as our categories for Nemesis. And we can report data out by those categories for you. Next slide, please. Eric, and there's a Gary, Gary, I have a question on that slide. Sure. Um, there are many agencies that cover a mixture of those four categories. And I'm wondering how you handle those. Is it the zip code of where their base station is, their main office where all their records are kept? Or did they have the opportunity to say, yeah, we're located in Chicago, but we also cover some of the suburbs and some rural area as part of uh, being the sole responder? So the service has the ability to indicate the incident location and its zip code. So it's, it's, if we're going to classify the services, then we're going to use the, and it plays on the line, he can correct me if I'm wrong. We're going to use the address provided for the demographic file of that particular agency. Is that correct, Clay? Play if you're talking, you're on mute. Can 
we may not be able to unmute. I will confirm that for you, Gary. But for the incident itself, we're going off the incident location provided by the clinician, which is why we get the, the NA no zip code required. If it's a demographics, we're going by the initial demographic file created by the agency uh, when they put in their dem file information to submit data to NEMSIS. So is this chart um, the zip code of the 48 million responses that occurred? Yes, this is based on the, the 46 million EMS activations. Oh, okay. So it's not at the agency level, is it? The response? No, it's not at the agency level. We only okay. had 14,000 agencies. No. Okay, the agency, and, and what Gary's referring to is the agency can get a little hokey. Um, if, and I'll use GMR, for example. Uh, Global Medical Response obviously could list one address for all their U.S. operations. And that would not be the address you would want to use for all their stations. So the question then becomes, if you were looking at agencies or actual EMS response stations, you would want to know the zip code for each individual station, not the county's um, headquarters or the regional program's headquarters. And uh, Gary is absolutely correct. When you're looking at that, you have to be very careful um, when you're running the data for agency location. But for this particular here, just to make sure I'm not confused, this slide that you're projecting here is where the activation occurred. Yes, sir. So 38 million of 38 million of the EMS activations of that original 46 ground transports that we started out with are in an urban area by our definition of urban. Three million are in rural, 706,000 are in frontier, and then suburban makes up the rest. So I'll address the other three questions and then I'm happy to take any questions or provide any additional information you're looking for. There was a question about billing information. There is an e-payment section in Nemesis with standardized questions for collecting billing information. But as I described earlier, billing information primarily stays at that local agency level. There are only seven states that require agencies to pull that billing information for, or send billing information from the agency to the state. In those seven states, and we, we have an updated slide presentation that we'll send you with a map that shows this, but the seven states that require agencies to submit billing information to them are Colorado, South Dakota, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Massachusetts, and Maine. They require some or all of the e-payment section in the data dictionary of NEMSIS to be sent to the state from the agency level. The other 43 states and territories in DC do not. So there was another question then, could, is that a hard fast rule or do agencies submit data to the state and they just, they just don't use it or they, they um, it's kind of like a soft submission. I'll, I'll use it as, as kind of a bad term, but that's the question. And the answer is no. If the state doesn't require them to send it, their data system is not set up to accept it. So they either fall into the category of one of the seven who will take it or the others do not. So there isn't, a, there isn't another way to get to it. And I think that was the end of the questions that were submitted to us initially. I am happy to address any questions you have. I do want to make one comment based on what I heard earlier. The definitions that you're working on are key and critical. I would just ask that you take, um, take one, one, keep one thought in mind. And I'll use the definition of implied consent that Gam mentioned earlier. Implied consent is clearly defined in the, and I have it here in front of me, the AAOX textbook. I just happen to have that one available. 
And I'll tell you why that's important, because the clinician is making the decision based on that definition and recording the data in Nemesis based on that definition. And the Nemesis data element was originally established for the clinician, so it's following that definition as well. And we've seen this with when we look at statutory definitions, there's often conflict and no greater example exists than emergency or non-emergency transport. Um, the definitions in statute for emergency and non-emergency in some states or the requirement of lights and sirens are often being interpreted in billing and billers as a definition of emergency and non-emergency. So as you establish your definitions, I would just ask that you think about what the clinician is going to be looking at and coding and reporting and making their decision based on as you develop yours. Questions for me about Nemesis, other data that you would like to see. Tell me what you would like to get to and we'll do everything we can do to get you that information. Eric, thank you so much for that presentation. And we're gonna, uh, the, I already see several committee members have their hands raised. And so, and then we are now opening up the chat to the public as well to ask questions. So I will start with Patricia. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that treatment in place slide that you had there. So I think you summed it up by saying about 2 million um, folks are treat based on your data are treated in place. And I, I believe you may have answered this when you had come before to one of the subcommittees. Can you talk a little bit about what kinds of treatment that is? And do you have a breakdown of that? Like what kinds of treatment? And so we just have a sense of like how much how much resources are being used by our ground ambulances, either in terms of time and energy and expertise and or supplies um, for those treatment in place? Yes, ma'am. If, if the person could running the slides could go back a couple, I'll, I'll tell you when to stop. But so we can do a little bit uh, more detail on what's in. You can. Uh, let's see. Back up. I'm sorry, go back to the previous slide, the one you were just on. Go back, please. I think it's the next one. Back one more, please. Keep going. Keep going. Go the other, I'm sorry, go the other way. That one. That one, that's it. So yes, um, we can go back and look at the, the primary reason for encounter and determine you know, what the initial call was for and, and determine what the breakdown for that is. I, I can put that on the list and get that for you. It's not a problem. Um, I will tell you that not all of the treatment in places are captured here, at least by my perspective. And Gary may be able to speak to this as well. For those EMS, well, that's going to muddy the waters. Never mind. Uh, for the EMS activations that we're talking about, the 46 million, the treatment in place that's provided are listed here in that 3.6% and 1.71%. And we can go back and look for the reason for dispatch and primary reason for encounter and uh, what the clinician's primary impression was and get you a better understanding of what's what that call was about. Does that, that answer your question, you. Patricia? Do you have a follow-up? No, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Rhonda. Hi, thank you very much for this presentation. My question was kind of along the same thing as Patricia. These numbers for non-transport seem very, very low to me. And um, is this an area where maybe the ambulance provider doesn't fill out the question? You said that some of the they don't have to fill out all of the questions. So I was just curious about that. So each one of the patient encounters listed here of this 46 million resulted in a patient care report being generated. So then for the, the non-transports, 
we could look at the other category and see if there's something glaring in there, but these are all accounted for as an activation somewhere in Nemesis. So we can break it down further and see, again, kind of the same lines, what some of these categories were. Are there specific ones you're interested in? Yeah, I don't think I have any specific that I'm interested in. I just think the overall numbers are quite low. Okay. So we know from the from the 46, um, 33 were were straight up patient was treated and transported by EMS. So that that leaves us with 13 million activations that we want to look at more specifically. I'm assuming that um, standby at public safety fire EMS operational support is, is not something you're interested in a breakdown on, but you would like to know for those specifically two categories, patient treated and released and patient treated and released per protocol and AMA with the breakdown. Were they cardiac patients? Were they motor vehicle crashes? And the example that I gave you, um, were they diabetic patients? Were they uh, opioid uh, patients where Narcan was given and the patient refused transport then? Yeah. We can certainly give you a better breakdown of those. You know, falls and things like that. And I think it's getting towards, you know, um, supporting community paramedicine because these calls might have been able to be handled by community paramedicine um, instead of a ground ambulance. And, you know, kind of some supporting data on being able to ask that those community paramedicine services be provided. Yes, ma'am. And I think that there, this is pure speculation on my part. I think there are several, I think a large portion of these cat, not a large portion, I think there's a, a significant portion of those patients fall into that 33 million category there because they're just transported because that's the way the services get paid. That's what I've been told. Perfect. And I think the data is right now, the data that we're looking at based upon our charges, patients and consumers, but right now your data is showing 33 million patients are being transported by ambulance to some, some location based upon what you indicated, whether they should have gone by, gone that way or not, I don't think is the charge of our committee yet, but this is what that is showing, correct? You're absolutely correct. Fantastic. 33 million were transported and the next slide says where they were transported to. Excellent. Ted, I think you have a question. Yeah, and I just think it's as you get into this, you see resuscitation attempted, you know, those um, th those are actually taking care at the scene or treatment in place so that you need to bring that into the number also um, or any one of these categories where you're actually treating. Um, I think that that just gives a better scope of, you know, obviously there's a cost piece to that. We all know when a resuscitation like that um, is quite a bit of effort to make that happen. Um, and a lot of equipment and a lot of time, uh, rightfully so, just try to save somebody like that and then potentially being pronounced um, at the scene under protocol. So I just think you want to wrap in anything that is a treatment of an EMS at a scene that then does not result in a transport, just as a thought there. And Sean, I see you have a question or comment. Yeah, I, I guess I just kind of follow up with what um, Ted said, which basically when we look at this, we see a 27% rate of something happened uh, other than a transport. 73% of the calls result in a transport. Those are the one, the 73% are the ones that potentially generate some kind of revenue. Um, so when we go back to the discussion we had earlier this morning about the Medicare cost data collection efforts and everything else, that really it's the whole um, global set of the things you see listed that are the true cost drivers. Um, yes, there's a lot of little subcategories here and everything else, but in order to be in place and ready to respond, regardless of which result other than the 73% that, that got an ambulance transport, um, that cost structure had to be in place for it. Sean and Ted, you're absolutely correct. I would also move in um, patient evaluated, no treatment and transported. The assessment was completed and the patient was determined to not need transport. Um, certainly all of the categories of 
patient treated, whether they were transferred to another ambulance or transported by EMS or transported by law enforcement, any of those where the patient was treated certainly drive cost. Because as you said, someone really cost is driven by activation. Somebody responded to all of these 46 million responses, right? If you want to look at it by, by pure cost, somebody was, was sent to 46 million EMS activations. 33 million resulted in direct transport to EMS, but the remaining, what was it, the remaining 13 million still had something done by EMS or EMS had a role with that particular incident if there wasn't a patient. It wasn't an option for them not to go, I guess, is the category, is, is the way I'm trying to say it. Eric, and I have a question for you as well as kind of a follow-up to a few um, of the sure. committee members here. The 33 million that we have in an actual transport occurring, um, so I have an additional 13 million that you've broken up into some of, several of these different categories. Um, just as a point of clarification, the qualifier is that an electronic patient care report has to be submitted for the data to trigger to the state to trigger to this database, correct? Correct. Okay, so as long as an electronic patient care report is provided, then it's gonna it's going to be reflective in these numbers. And I know I keep reiterating just for the public's perspective, just to try to break it down in plain English. You you are correct. Right. If, it, if uh, an ambulance went out for whatever reason and, and provided care but never generated a patient care report, we would not know about it. You we would not know about it. Perfect. Um, and so the additional thirteen million that we have going on here is there a way for you to um, bifurcate that data based because since this is an actual um, call, like a um, 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 assist that they're calling out an assist, we sometimes could have maybe numerous assists happen to the same patient. Can you bifurcate that data down to that level or no? Let me take a look. Let me start with why the assist occurred and then tried to take it to the patient level. If there was a patient, there may have not been a patient in those first three categories. It may have been a response. But, but again, if that response is to um, assist another agency at, at a scene as, as, part of a, as part of a motor vehicle crash with a, a lot of motor vehicles involved or something, you know, we'll be able to get to whether there was a patient or not a patient. And then the second part of the category is it's, I mean, it's still going to your cost. Again, sure. it, wasn't, it wasn't an option to not respond, but let us get some greater specificity um, on breaking down these particular categories as requested. And maybe that'll help. Once we look at it, then we'll, we'll look at the incident and then we'll get, we'll try to get to the patient level as well. Sure. And, and right now what we're looking at cost in one factor and then what that does to, to, to drive the price, and we'll get into the definitions of that, which is the technically oftentimes the bill charge that a consumer will receive um, when there's not a patient contact made. So that's all, of course, put into the price or the cost of the service. What I'm really interested in seeing is it like in three different buckets, where was there no patient contact, there was an assist, same patient, if we can provide that, um, where there was nothing, then there when one where there was contact made with the patient, regardless kind of to Ted's point and others, um, if they were dead on scene, if they even if they didn't make, they, they arrived on scene, maybe they didn't see the patient, patient was declared dead at that point in time or before they arrived on scene and then where they actually made patient contact um, and there was no subsequent transport. It's the, the 33 million is obviously there, but I'd love to see if we could kind of put that into maybe three buckets, maybe four, you may have a fourth bucket in that 13 million. So we can kind of understand this drives cost. Consumer may have received a bill depending upon certain practices of each of the individual agencies. If they actually made contact with no transport, some care, some, some, sometimes consumers get bills for that. Sometimes they don't, just so we can understand the behavior pattern. Okay. And then when we're doing this, are you interested? How interested are you in the rural, urban, suburban, and frontier? Very oh, interested. Time. That would be very interesting. Yeah. That's a very, uh, the way that you broke that down to me is very interesting. I don't know about the other committee members, but that would be very interesting to me. Very okay. interesting. Rhonda. 
Um, just another question here for you. Um, of the seven states that require billing information to be submitted, would it be worthwhile for us to see some of that data broken down um, that help the committee? So just a, a point bef before you go too far. So we do not take that data at the national level. So we would have to reach out to the state, which we would be happy to do, and say, could we work on behalf of this committee to run some basic analytics on the billing data that you have to see what's available, to see what would what, what could support the committee's work? And we're happy to do that, but we need a little bit more direction on specifically what you're looking for beyond what data do you have, what's your interest? And I'm assuming that uh, the e-payment dictionary that you have available, is that available, what those elements are? Is that in the, the enhanced slide presentation you'll be given to us? Yes, sir. It, well, you, yes. Um, okay. It'll have the link of where to go to get to those. Okay. Um, but if you go to the data dictionary that's available at nemsys.org, um, it will have a, a very specific breakdown. Every element is clearly defined and the attribute associated with the element is clearly defined. So you'll be able to see, for example, you know, the, the insurance information is collected, the billing information or the, the, um, the insurance type, the, the uh, social security number in some cases, those types of fields are defined in, in the e-payment section. Perfect. Uh, Ritu. Yeah, uh, just two, I guess, quick points. Back on the whole canceled prior to arrival, I mean, I, those would, a number of my agencies don't do not do a chart. I mean, the only place to get that number is really straight from CAD data. Um, so that would be, you know, one, we're always going to underestimate the number of times an ambulance or fire engine or fire or apparatus was was can was um canceled but prior to arrival uh, and then with regards to to the point around cost of treatment place um just sort of delving into like how much was spent and 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 etc uh one i just wanted to reinforce that um yes cardiac arrests that are not transported are a significant time and expense and they need to be included in that discussion, um, but also that um, moving forward, if treat in place becomes more uh, pervasive as it, be, um, that the costs that we look at from 2022 may not reflect costs if it becomes more pervasive in the future. You would, I would expect sort of more things to happen prior to, to, to being uh, left in place. So there are, at the National Association of State EMS Officials meeting in last year, or I'm sorry, this year, we proposed expanding this data set for more treatment in place information. Um, that is, we, we respond to really in the SEMSO as the kind of, not the owner, but well, in some ways, the owner of this particular product. And if they want us to expand this to account for treatment in place, we're happy to do so. But you are absolutely correct, sir. This was designed to, Nemesis was designed to capture the emergency 911 response. Over the years, it has morphed into capturing more information on interfacility transport, on helicopter transport, and fixed wing transport, and some critical care. So, if, um, and, and I, I mean, I see that happening quite honestly, but that's the question that's proposed to the SEMSA's leadership now is to what expansion NEMSA should take on to accommodate more treatment in place data for the purposes you're talking about right now. And I, I, one quick example, ET3 added to the disposition list um, in version 3.5 alcohol and drug rehab uh, facilities as a transport destination. And that was added specifically um, as a part of the ET3 model um, to, to meet that uh, possibility for billing purposes. So um, that's a good example of, of just responding to 
the changes in, in the environment in which EMS is functioning. Gary, I see you, your hand is raised. Yeah, I had a, um, I agree that having the um, payment side information available would be good for us. And when you ask the states if there's a way, or maybe when you get the data and have zip codes, maybe there's a way to break those down by urban, suburban, rural, and frontier to, so we can see if there's any patterns regarding insurance payments uh, across the um, various sectors. So just as a point of clarification for the payment data that's available, in my understanding, in Colorado, South Dakota, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Maine, and Massachusetts. Did I get those states right? I was writing fast. Yes, sir. You have them. Um, the, and I'll, we'll go look at the data dictionary of the information. From your understanding, while I know it's not reported from the state level to the federal level at this point in time, are they capturing all elements as defined in the NIMSIS database, or is that a, a question you don't know? I don't know. To. And that question could vary. The answer could vary from state to state. Um, so that would be one that we would, we one question we would ask is, what are you collecting? And then do the comparison. We can see what states collect what data elements um, at the NEMSIS TAC. So we can take a look at it first from our level and then get to the granularity that you're seeking. Is that possible? If I guess that would probably be the first thing that I would ask to even see if they're collecting enough data that would even be even relevant from those seven states that we could make any type of conclusive recommendation or finding in our final report. If, if that's something you guys have the ability to do, um, Eric, or if that might be something we have to ask somebody else to do. Yes, sir. Ask, but we can run any, we, we can do that work. Oh, um, what I would need or what I would ask from you is okay. certainly I understand the, the question of what data is collected, who collects what elements, and then comparing the states. But what is it that you would really like to know? I hear Jonathan Washko in the background begin with the end in mind. Tell me what it is that you want to know. You want to know how many ambulance services, we'll pick Colorado just because they were first on my list. Within the state of Colorado, how many ambulance services are billing? And of those ambulance services that bill, what, you know, what's the breakdown of the types of calls that they're running or where they're transporting to? That's what I would need to know to help you get to, to what you're looking for. There was a question in the chat from the public as well, asking if the data or if you've broken data down by region, by region. We uh, do. And if, um, and, it, and if you have, how do you define the regions? And that's what I was going to say. Regions are like pediatrics. Everybody asks for pediatric reports. Do you want pediatric by, uh, you know, we use elementary, middle, and high. At NHTSA, we use pediatric definitions based on what fits into a safety seat, a seat belt, the weight. Um, we use NHTSA regions, FEMA regions. Um, it just depends. We can do regional data. Yeah, you tell me what the regions are that you want to look at, and we can certainly do uh, a regional report for you. It's just whose definition do you want to use? Any questions for Eric while we have him here from the committee? Any more public comment on data that you might particularly find useful? Uh, I will tell you, we'll probably reconvene at our next meeting to see what other data would be of it, would be uh, as we continue to look at certain other components into the next half. Eric, so I'm sure we'll be getting back with you on some of that data as well. Um, I see Patricia, you've got a question. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to ask, um, I believe that you said this was reflective of 2022 data. And so I just wanted, you know, not knowing what happened, you know, pre pandemic and knowing that COVID kind of has spilled into 2022. Did, do you have a sense of like, th this is reliable, like somewhat normal numbers that we would see? So, you know, we're, we'd be, we're using obviously this data in our analysis. So just wanted to see if you had any flags for us on that. 
So we're looking at, and I'll just pick motor vehicle crashes because we're NHTSA. We, we have a, a report that we run called um, EMS by the numbers. And we look at motor vehicle crash activations, for example, um, on a weekly basis. And we look at the pre-COVID years, we call it 2018 and 19. And in 2020, we see the big spike when uh, when um, the, the president made the announcement and we started to see um, a decline in states closing. We saw motor vehicle crashes, the numbers plummet, but we saw the ejections just go the opposite direction because people were driving faster. There was no one on the road, reckless driving, uh, unbelted, whatever. And then things kind of, you know, stayed um, stayed up for, for all of 2020 and the bulk of 2021. We saw the same thing for cardiac arrests at home. Um, in fact, the, the American Heart Association worked with us on their Don't Die in Doubt campaign as we looked at some large urban areas where the numbers of people dying in their homes just increased dramatically uh, because they didn't want to go to the hospital because that's where the COVID was. At least that's our, that's our speculation. So um, we can look at data 2018, 2019, compare it to 2022. And we can also look at 2023 to, uh, we use a two week buffer. We have about 85% of all the reports that are, you're gonna receive in the US in about 72 hours now. Um, COVID has cut down that reporting timeline. This data is extremely timely. So we can look at the first part of 2023, but I'm fairly confident that we're not gonna see anything different between the first six months of 2023 and what you see now for all of 2022. Thanks. As well, this is Gam, just a quick comment. And I apologize sure. for not raising my, my hand, but I um, want of course uh, thank uh, Eric for, for the presentation on, on Nemesis. He, he just spends really innumerable hours um, helping to manage this, uh, this national system. And, uh, you know, as he mentioned, it's a very close, collaborative, long-term effort with uh, the state and territorial EMS offices, as well as all the way down to the uh, clinician level folks who are actually collecting the state uh, data patient side. Um, you know, as we, as we look at the data, I would just, you know, encourage us as we have questions about particular states to, um, to work with Eric and to, to reach out to uh, the individual state EMS offices as, as well, because um, they really offer a, a valuable perspective about uh, about the data collection effort as well. And Gam, number one is from the committee's perspective and chair, and I know from others, uh, we're very, very appreciative for mm -hmm. NHTSA um, presenting several times um, on this data set as well. I'd like to just make one comment though, just for the public that's listening in as well. And this goes to Eric's point um, and some of the stuff that we continue to talk about that data is only good as what you input into it. And so if an EPCR, if you don't bill for services, for instance, or um, as Dr. Um, Ritu indicated here as well, that in, in where he's the medical director, they sometimes don't bill for a response. Um, and so there may not be a medical record or there could be an assist. Um, and I think um, some committee members were getting at that as well. And so if we're looking at this to see, can you substantiate the cost of a service? Um, this data set may not be um, totally inclusive of all of that to come to a conclusion that this is all of the activations that EMS does across the nation. Um, but what it does allude to, uh, which I think provides a benefit, is how many activations may be resulting in some type of billing occurring. Um, and because we are part of the No Surprises Act, and that's what we're looking at, this potentially um, has the ability to at least show some of that that might be going on um, as we can continue to deliberate on into the next few months, specifically around some of the other data Eric, that you and your team will hopefully continue to be able to provide to us around the treatment in place, the AMAs or the against medical advice, the patient refusals, different things like that, that potentially could result in some type of bill to a consumer um, that may not necessarily be covered by an insurance carrier um, or may be covered and results in a balanced bill as well. 
Any other questions from the committee? I'll see if we have any more public comments. Um, I know every public comment will be reinforced. We do have a few more minutes here before we do break. So do wanna give time for the public to have input um, as well as the committee while we have um, uh, um, the individuals from NHTSA and NEMSIS here. As Bell, just one quick Eric, question sure. for me, and it's based on one of the, the comments in chat, um, which is how many ambulance services bill, how significant is getting to that number for you, or is it what they're billing for? Because it is, is very difficult to figure out how many actually bill. We may be able to look at that at a state level, but nationally, that is a that's a, a significant, it's a very tough question to get to. And I think that's a, a, a very, another really good point, Eric, you just made. I know there was one last public comment that did make when we're talking through and um, 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 continuing to deliberate on in the next several months regarding payer information, assurance information that might be through some databases. Oftentimes, um, this commenter noted that sometimes the information is outdated, may not be subsequently updated into, so perspective is going to be important when we're looking at billing information. So we'll do a deep dive. Interesting to see the information, um, Eric, that you're able to come back to the committee on specifically around that e-payment system and what is actually available out there and what they're reporting on um, that might help aid some of our additional questions that we might have for you um, um, in relation to the actual elements. While all elements are available and we can see that on NEMSYS, are they using all elements or is it just certain elements to see if we can even drive some questions um, to you that you might be able to, to um, decipher out of the data. Any other comments? Not, I'll, tear, I'll turn this over to Tara. We might get a little bit, a few more minutes of our lunchtime or whatever, Tara. Thank you. Today's agenda and a list of the public comment topics are available for download in the chat window. We will now take a mid-day break and resume at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. <laughs> 